Cominciamo? Good morning, welcome to everyone for our Italian guests. Uh, I will say two words in Italian, but then in the session it will... Che devo fare? Ah, ancora un minuto. Vabbè, so, one minute more, but uh, for no, our non-Italian guests, I will say the introduction will be in Italian, so do, but don't worry. Uh, <laughs> it's just for our Italian public, but then the session will be in English. <clears throat> Emotions. So I think that the main emotion that drives my work and possibly my life. Prevalentemente l'amore per il prossimo. So eventually we can position ourselves in the perspective of someone else. Sono state tante le emozioni legate agli incontri. Che è quella della condivisione, condividere esperienze. Le immagini della memoria non funzionano se non ci appassionano. The emotion that makes me happy in vision of the creation. This dichotomy between emotions and rationality is something that has actually dominated my life. La sorpresa. Il fascino dello studiare il cervello. Curiosity. A kind of passionate curiosity. La curiosità è un'emozione complessa. So, Curiosity is an emotion that really has driven me in my work. Benvenuti a questo So welcome to this uh, third event of our uh, Brain Forum called Emotions, and of course, our very best introduction could not be but by listening to the scientists who have taken part in our events. This event has been uh, organized by the European Brain Research Institute and Brain Circle Italia. Well, this meeting is devoted to beauty and the emotions which it uh, gives rise to in the brain and how the brain interprets beauty, but also beauty in science. We are trying to establish a bridge between different uh, disciplines, neurosciences, art, culture, literature. And this bridge is perfectly exemplified by Paola and Rita Levi-Montancini. The first was a great artist, uh, and the second was a great scientist, and throughout their lives. These sisters have had a constant dialogue in writing and orally uh, about science and art. EBRI is a, an institution on brain research founded in 2002 by Rita Levi Montalcini. So this institute has been working now for 20 years. The uh, researchers of EBRI study the fundamental mechanisms of the brain as a solid foundation to develop therapies to fight against the serious diseases affecting the brain. And one of the activities that this institute carries out in line with what Rita wanted is, of course, to disseminate science knowledge. And this event is part and parcel of this uh, uh, dissemination and outreach activity, which, out of much further ado, I'd like to thank all our sponsors. I don't have time here to list uh, them individually, but all the sponsors that have made this event not only possible, but which have uh, helped us throughout the Brain Forum events. I'd like to thank Maxi, President Giovanna Melandri, 
somebody will join us towards the end of our uh, day. And uh, I'd like uh, to move on. Our day, our morning is busy. We'll try and stick to the time schedule. And it is a great pleasure for me to introduce Viviana Kazam, president of Brain Circle Italia, and the veritable driving force behind this cycle event. She is responsible for having worked this out and, of course, is behind this present Rome event as well. So let me just say that Brain Circle Italia was founded with Revi Montacini and thanks to Pietro Calisano, her right-hand man. And we were established to disseminate neurosciences and neuroscience knowledge. So we've had a relationship with Ebri since the very beginning. I believe Rita would be very happy uh, for this um, conference dedicated to women because she was really keen to promote the work of women in science. And the reason why emotions was... Uh, thought of it started with a kind of um, self-criticism we have been organizing events for 12 years and i asked myself i'm a feminist i promote women and i asked myself why do i always invite men because men are more known, uh, famous. We want, of course, uh, to draw the attention of the public and of the press when you organize an event. So you invite uh, the well-known people, and they happen to be men. So I said, mm, we have to change. I worked with the two female scientist friends, mm, Daniela Perani and uh, uh, another important Italian scientist. And I thought, let us try and discover the most important worldwide women scientists working on the brain. We came up with 100, of na uh, 100 names. 50, of course, uh, uh, belong to our uh, uh, circle of uh, uh, well-known uh, friends and scientists. Uh, when we addressed uh, these uh, women, they enthusiastically answered our call. And then we asked ourselves, what should we talk about? I didn't want to have a kind of a, a women ghetto type situation. So we decided that we should devote this cycle of conferences to emotions. It is, however, a provocation because emotions have always been considered a female handicap, fragility. Women, since Aristotle, cannot have high-level brains because they are emotional, passionate, vulnerable, womb-oriented, not reliable. Over the last, however, 30 years, a bit more, we discovered that emotions are crucial are part and parcel of a rational thought in the brain. Once we thought that uh, um, emotions lied in the intestines, the liver, uh, and everywhere else, rather than the brain, some people thought that uh, emotions were given by the gods, and we were forced to act them out without actually involving our choices. We discovered today that emotions are crucial, fundamental, and our message, of course, is addressed to men as well, because men must learn to get back uh, their emotions. In our culture, the real man is strong, no emotions, he doesn't cry. But now, in order to uh, t deal with the challenges of the third millennium, we need to use emotional intelligence. This is our message from great women, but for all, because emotional intelligence is used to take ethical decisions, political decisions, to make such decisions in a time when the world is rapidly changing, to deal with problems such as migration, global warming, and all the new challenge. We need a different mindset. And uh, our very same uh, female skills and expertise. I'd like to thank for a moment uh, Sami Togasagol from Israel, who are our main supporters for this whole cycle of events, and Tiziana Mele, who is the CEO of Lundek, who uh, supported the Italian events. Without them, we wouldn't be here. Sponsors always sort of uh, uh, play a minor role in terms of visibility, but we, of course, you don't only need good ideas, you need those who made them uh, possible. So thank you. I'd like to thank Pietro Calisano, who have been the right-hand man for 40 years of Rita Levi Montagini. He's been working with me from the very beginning. Please.
Thank you, Emiliana. Thank you, Antonino. Indeed, I had the privilege of working with Rita Levi Montagini for more than 40 years, and with her, uh, of course, we founded uh, EBRI, and we carried out very interesting research projects uh, along the line of her uh, ideals. I just uh, considered how to introduce this very interesting topic, and I'd like to introduce it starting from a conclusions that neurobiologists, neurophysiologists, psychologists, anyone who deals with the mind share. Any function of the brain, memory, thought, awareness, self-awareness, conscience even, are based on neural networks. And for many centuries, this was a controversial uh, conclusion. Consider, for example, uh, Descartes, who made a distinction between res cogitans and res estes. So two different, separate worlds. Of course, the problem mind brain. But I believe that nowadays we all agree on the fact that the mental processes at different levels are, are, are based on or are founded on work through neural networks to a greater or lesser extent. But the problem is how do these mental processes arise from neural networks which are, work a, bit, a little bit like uh, microchips, to make a comparison. To introduce this issue, I thought I might go to a topic which I know very well. I'm a cellular biologist. What about a living cell? If we analyze a living cell, it consists of, of course, the DNA, proteins, the fat, an energy source, and so on. If you subdivide it in further elements, we find the fundamental ones, the carbon, silicone, and so on. In what way these structures give rise to something which is different from the uh, mere algebraic form? We call it life. This is a problem which has not been resolved yet. So much so that up till now, many biochemists, uh, researchers in the world have tried to reproduce or recreate life starting from these basic elements, and we have not managed. This does not mean that we may not manage in the future, in the near future, I'm convinced, but life is what I define, and many uh, physicists and mathematicians with me an emerging property from a set of uh, quantitative differences. What emerges is a quality, which is life. Let's move to uh, a more practical case, neurons. How we go from neurons to mental processes, memory, intelligence, and so on. We need a sort of hardware, basically the actual brain. It is a complex, very complex structure. And of course, in development, it creates that huge network of connections which make up our working brain. If we compare it to hardware, we must introduce a number of inputs, create basically a software, the whole of life during the uh, life of the embryo. And of course, uh, since the birth, we are constantly bombarded by stimuli, which of course shape the brain. And that's the so-called softer. From the coming together of these two structures, the brain and culture, we get what emerges is we get functions and properties which are not foreseeable by studying neurons and neural networks. This is something different and new. So today's topic is particularly interesting. How do emotions arise? They are emerging qualities. They come from them specific links and connections. And today, I'm sure we will hear some wonderful interpretations, findings uh, delivered by our scientists who will explain how we go from a brain structure to feelings, which, as I say, is emerging qualities of these various structures. 
I would now give the floor to our colleagues, but please let me uh, introduce a three minute long documentary, which was shot by Carlo Alberto Pinelli, a dear uh, friend in, uh, in Israel kibbutz in 2003. I'm very keen to show you this because these three minutes show Rita's personality in all its facets. And I'm very happy to show it to you because this is an introduction from the best possible perspective, her own. So can we please show this uh, uh, film? Rita was 93 years old, and she was surrounded by a group of uh, young researchers and neuroscientists, and they were kind of chatting away about their lives. Thank you. I'm from China, and my question is following. What do you think about it, the importance of women in future research? You know, if I understood your question, you have never to worry about this point, because it may change one day from you. Now women can do what I could not do when I was a young woman like you are now. So you have not to worry, or women should not, as the future may be very different from what we suspect it will be. So it is not important to believe. It is important always to act in a very ethical way, very rigorous, how you will behave, how you will face difficulty, how you will enjoy good moment, as it was for me. When you started with research, which problem did you face because you were a woman? For women, it was very difficult, almost impossible, to be a scientist or a social person and a good mother, good wife. Should they have no interest in being a professional worker, being women, they should be raised as future mother, wife and mother. I was against his age. So I said, I will never, never be neither a wife nor a mother. But I went to my way. So I did not decide I was not a scientist. I wanted to go with Albert Schweitzer to help against leprosy, which was very diffuse at the time in Africa. And I started medicine just to cure leprosy. Rita, what qualities do you think a scientist should have? I am not a scientist. I am more an artist than a scientist. My twin sister died, unfortunately, eight years ago was a very twin, different from me, but excellent person and an artist. My brother was a great architect. I do believe that I confront life, not as a scientist, but as an artist. Never they forget that what is important in our life is to be perfectly correct, help as possible the other, never mind if you are a scientist or an artist. I do work a great deal for women in Africa, and they are very intelligent, but they have been always prevented from study by men who want to impose their own capacity, which is not better than women. Intelligence is equally well distributed between men and women, even if the approach or problem is different. I'm from Italy, and despite my young age, I already had to go abroad working. But I have the dream to come back in Italy and help my country with my job. So you think one day I can come back and work in Italy? Of course. You can do very well, because in Italy we were excellent people. Top, really. We have no problem about intelligence. Italians are very intelligent. It's a gift from Italy and many other countries. So, you can find, if you have any desire to know, you can come to see me in Rome if you want. Uh, do you have any regrets of what you've done in your life? What they? About what you've done in your life, even though it's a really, you've got, you did really, really great things, but have you got still uh, some regrets? No. Nothing? Never. Never. <laughs> I don't, I me, mean, I don't care about uh, believing long, does make a difference. I do believe I had good luck 
to discover the NJ. Life does not end with your death. What it will survive to you is the way how you send program to other people. I mean, immortality is not your body, which of course is going to die. Too. I didn't care about dying, because what is important is the message that you give to other people. This is immortality of human being. So when you discovered first NGF, yes. Were you thinking that it would have come to have such a big importance in all no, the possible No, fields? I knew it was very important against the dogma of the time. I was against dogma and I said, no, we are not ad uh, uh, programmed like an insect because everything changes depending on the environment. If good or bad, the rest do not exist. The rest is unfortunate, exist. The death of people, six million women of Jewish people die because not as they are of inferior race. Einstein certainly, nobody would think that is a superior race. Is it? I mean, is it us? Grazie Pietro di aver condiviso. Thank you, Pietro, for having shared this uh, film, which uh, beautifully summarizes much of what Rita believed in and what uh, we will be dealing with today. It's a great contribution. You can find this uh, video on the EBRI website. Now, speaking of emotions, emotions are often intertwined with experiences such as music. If we speak of emotions, we thought it would be important to arouse emotions. So I thought we might uh, uh, invite uh, a great artist, Agnese Coco. Uh, Agnese Coco is uh, an, a harp player, as you can uh, deduce uh, from the instrument. And in 2003, she won an international competition, had uh, uh, harpist in Rome, the opera, uh, Rome Opera House, and she has been studying under Riccardo Muti. She, of course, is a soloist and in musical uh, ensembles throughout the world. I'm very uh, grateful to Agnese Coco for having, for having offered to play for us. Hello. The first uh, piece I would like to start with is a well-known piece from Claude Debussy, Claire de Lune, from Sweet Bergamasque. It is characterized by a, a, very, a very good melody, which is uh, soft to the ear, and it's also highly uh, refined from a harmony perspective. So this uh, mix uh, is very evocative and stirring. And uh, this uh, piece was used by many directors uh, as, of course, uh, uh, the sound column of their films. Thank you.
Grazie davvero. Thank you. In addition to uh, emotions, as a scientist, I'm fascinated by the motor dexterity used by this artist. Uh, it could be a fascinating uh, theme indeed, but let us move on to English. We will start uh, our sessions with our speakers. To start now, uh, invite on stage uh, our first speaker, Christina Alberini. Uh, Christina is professor of neural science at the New York University. Christina studies the molecular mechanisms underlying memory consolidation and reconsolidation and strategies to enhance and modify memories. She has done landmark uh, uh, papers uh, on this uh, field and she's uh, an established and uh, internationally recognized neuroscientist. She has worked with Eric Kandel before becoming an independent scientist. And she will talk about how emotions shape memories, and she will discuss the tight bidirectional link between long-term memory processes and the underlying biology. Christina. Thank you, Antonino. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, and I am very happy and uh, delighted and honored to be here to celebrate the extraordinary Rita Levi Montalcini, to celebrate science and all women. And I'd like to thank very much the organizers, uh, Brain Circle Italia and Ebri, for putting together such a wonderful series of events uh, that it goes through these eight cities and uh, brings together women that dedicate their life to science. And a special thank to Viviana Kazam for putting such a wonderful energy and soul into this organization. Thank you, Viviana. So as we start, thank you, Viviana. As we start uh, our day, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the work that we have been doing and also others, many others, about how emotions shape memories. And because to, in Rome, the, uh, our uh, event is talking about art and beauty and the brain, you may wonder what art has to do with memory. Uh, I can assure you that it has to do a lot. Art is a memory. The expression of art from the artist, the perception of art from who enjoys art, is about an experience, a personal experience, the individual experience of who we are. And it's an intertwine between emotion and history of the individual, whatever happens to us in life. As such, the perception changes over time uh, as, as we change over time according to our experiences. We are who we are because of our memories. And this is not just about art, it's everything we do in life. Most of what we do is about memories. When we talk about this type of memories, we refer to a special type, which is known as long-term memory, because there is no such a memory single. Uh, memories exist in many different shapes and forms, and they are classified according, for example, to their duration, like short-term memories and long-term memories. But today we're gonna talk about long-term memories, the memories that last for days, weeks, uh, months, years, even a lifetime. And we all experience certain type of memories of events that happen once in our life, and they last for our entire life. In the long-term memory groups, we have subgroups. And a major distinction is between explicit type of memories and implicit type of memories. The explicit types are the memories that are recalled with consciousness. They require conscious recollection. And in the explicit types, we have subtypes for example, the episodic type of memories, these are the, memory, the, the memories of specific events in life and their context, or semantic memories, memories of general knowledge about the world. So for example, in the episodic type, if I say, 
a happy day in your life, the day of your wedding or your divorce. Uh, and if I, I give you another example for semantic memories, one example, for example, if I say the word dog or city, you all know what I mean. You have the concept, you have learned it. So this general, this general uh, knowledge about the word is part of the semantic uh, types of memories. And then on the other side, we have the implicit types. The implicit type of memories are those that are recalled unconsciously. We don't need conscious to, rec to recall this type of memories. For example, and here I'm talking about just a couple of them, priming or procedural memories. Procedural memories are the memories of how to do things. Playing piano, riding a bike, skiing. We don't need consciousness to recollect these memories. We do that automatically. Dance in the moonwalk. Collectively, all these memories make who we are. But we're gonna talk about episodic memories, the memories of our life, the history of our life, who we are, what we did throughout our life. And these are the memories that we focus on in my lab. Uh, these type of memories are processed by a brain region that is called medial temporal lobe, and the medial temporal lobe is the region behind our ears. In this region, we have important brain regions that process the information to start uh, the mechanisms that lead to long-term memories. Two major regions are the hippocampus, uh, and the other one is the amygdala. The hippocampus takes its name by this, uh, the, the shape uh, of, of the region, and also the amygdala. The amygdala is an almond shape. These two regions interact with each other, and whereas the hippocampus uh, is connected and cross talks to a number of cortical regions to start lay down the long-term memories, the amygdala, uh, with a, a number of connections throughout all these regions, uh, regulates the emotional valence of the experience. So hippocampus and amygdala cross talk intimately, intimately to make long-term memories of episodes in life that are charged with emotions. And in fact, single episodes in life do not become long-term memories if they are not emotionally charged. We need emotions together with the experience in order to form long-term memories. And this happens, as I mentioned, between amygdala and hippocampus and the crosstalk with other regions, like cortical regions, for example, the medial prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex. So how does this happen? When we form a new memory from a new episode in life, this memory is in a labile state, is fragile for some time. And during this temporal window, it becomes stable, so there is a process of stabilization that is called consolidation. So memory consolidation stabilizes the information that we have been perceived and makes this information become a long-term memory. This happens, as I mentioned, if there is an emotion attached to it. Just imagine how many episodes in life that you didn't care about. How many of those have been forgotten? We forget, mostly. But those that are important, emotionally important, we remember them for a long time. And the length of time for remembering this is linked to the intensity of the emotion. Arousal, excitement, stress, traumas. So we have an old gamut of emotions. And the emotions can be positive. The wonderful, happy day, the most happy day of our life and victory or they can be scary or sad, even traumatic. If I say, where were you last year uh, on August 21st, you probably will not remember unless there was an important event. But if I say, where were you September 11, 2001, you remember that. <clears throat> That's the power of emotion. So how this happens is through the regulation of hormones that processes emotions. For example, in a stressful event or arousing event, we know we have 
adrenaline that is released and noradrenaline released in the brain. And if the emotion is, is even stronger, we have the release of cortisol, stress hormones, all of which act on brain regions, sorry, on brain regions uh, that, as I mentioned, are uh, modulating the circuitry between, between the hippocampus and cortical regions. So all these changes that occur in the brain will make the long-term memory storage. What is it? It's a physical modification in this circuitry. It's a biological change that leads to a morphological modification. As my advisor, Eric Kandel, used to say, if you form a long-term memory, you get another wrinkle in your brain. So today, if you form a long-term memory of this event, you're going to go back home and you're going to have another wrinkle in the brain. Of course, it's not really a wrinkle. It's a morphological modification that keep this information for long term. As I mentioned, the length of the storage, the duration of the storage, has to do with the intensity of emotions. The stronger is the emotion, the longer will be the memory, and the more detail will be the memory. But it's not that simple. This happens up to a certain intensity. And in fact, memory uh, storage follows a function that has this inverted U shape. So a little bit of stress, arousal, or emotion is good. We need that to form long-term memories up to an optimal level, after which the intensity of the emotion will cause a drop in performance. So if the event is too stressful, let's say traumatic, what you're going to see is that the memory loses the um, the details, the memories are going to be somewhat impaired. The memory is going to be long-lasting for a traumatic event, but it's not going to be detailed. It's going to be a strange memory, a different than the memory of, of a positive or arousing event not so intense. So we have two uh, processes ongoing. One is the adaptive event, forming long-term memories in an adaptive way, and the other is the maladaptive, when the emotion is too intense and causes loss of memory recall or expression. So let's start with the first one. How does it work? I'm not going to go into details because we have spent a lot of years studying the molecular changes occurring in these brain regions. We have identified a number of pathways, some of which are uh, listed here uh, with the exciting findings on some of them because with some of these we can increase memories or decrease memories. Uh, but what we do is to get into the, these brain regions and of course we use uh, animal models in the lab and those are rodents, mice or rats, uh, which undergoes learning events such as, for example, the one that I'm showing up here. This is called inhibitory avoidance. The animal learns to avoid a context that was previously paired with a food shock. So it is an aversive experience. They form long-term memories. We can go into their brain and ask, what is the biology that changes in these brain regions? How does long-term memory form and store? So we did a number of studies on that. As I mentioned, a number of pathways. But also what we found is that many different cell types in the brain contributes to long-term memory formation. Uh, this is important because until now, most of neuroscientists talk about neurons. Well, in the brain, we have different cell types. And what we found is that it's not just about neurons. Neurons, together with a number of other cell types, glia, subpopulations, and even cells of the vasculature, cooperate together, together to form long-term memories. And what we study is also uh, the connectivity or the crosstalk among brain regions, for example, hippocampus with cortical regions, and also the influence of the amygdala, the region that processes emotions on this circuitry and the modulation. Now let's go to the other side of the 
inverted U curve. What happens when we have too much emotion? Let's say a very stressful event. What happens to the biology of the brain? To study that, we need a model. So we went back to the lab and tried to change the intensity of the foot shock. And we will be able to reproduce the inverted U curve uh, in these animals. So these animals subjected to a certain level, mild level of foot shock. They have a certain level of memory. If we increase the foot shock level, we increase the memory expression. But if we increase it even further, we see memory uh, loss, memory impairment. So with this inverted U curve, we will be able, we, we're able to go into the brain regions and ask what is the changes in the circuitry that normally form long-term memories. And what we found in summary is that the rats that receive a very strong shock, let's call it a traumatic event, had more anxiety, but it was when they receive a second traumatic event, which we tested, that they then revealed they, uh, a, a number of responses that are typical of psychopathologies, like, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder. They showed more anxiety, a resistance to extinction, which is a new learning that tells the animal that not every time there is a traumatic event. They also showed more generalization, and that is they, have, they were afraid of places and contexts in which they never had a bad experience. And at the mechanistic level, these animals had an increased expression of receptors for the stress hormones, glucocorticoid receptors. They also had a blunted cortisol response, which means a blunted response to stress hormones, which is important to fluctuate in order for us to react and have, be able to form long-term memories. So we concluded from these studies that the biology of this type of memories, which is very intense, with very intense emotions, is different. The circuitry involved is also different. And it was that the repetition of traumas, not just the first one, is the repetition of traumas that lead to post-traumatic stress disorders. So do we have an opportunity now that we know a little bit <clears throat> to identify, to, to try and find a way to prevent or treat these disorders. These disorders are very severe. We have PTSD that develops also with aggression, addiction, and sometimes even suicides. Let's think about the soldiers coming back from combat. We have anxiety disorders, depression, addiction, these are severe neuropathologies. Can we treat them? You may have seen a movie which is called The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. In Italian, it's Se mi lasci ti cancello. In this movie, in a Hollywood way, uh, they present the concept that we have seen in science, and that is that when we retrieve, when we remember when we retrieve memories that have been consolidated recently, these memories can become fragile again. And again, they are fragile for a temporal uh, uh, limit, for a temporal window, and then temporal window. And then during this temporal window, they reconsolidate to become stored and again uh, in, a, in, a, in a strong uh, way that is not changeable anymore. So there is a process of restabilization after retrieval called reconsolidation. In this temporal window, we can actually, if the animal remembers, we can actually try to change the intensity of the memory, which we did. We and others uh, found that when the memories are retrieved by using either pharmacological approaches or behavioral approaches, uh, that interferes with the reconsolidation mechanisms, what we end up with is a decrease in memory intensity. So we can weaken this type of memories and decrease the symptoms. Now, this is in the animal model. 
These data have been tested in humans, in human population with PTSD and addiction with some effect, not as much as we would hope, because obviously in the lab we have very controlled conditions, but the uh, message is that it is possible to weaken very strong memories that are linked to psychopathologies. And in fact, we have seen that if we inject some uh, drug that blocks plasticity mechanisms in the brain regions that process memory information, for example, the hippocampus, after memory is recalled, we don't see any effect. The memory remains strong as it was before. But when we inject these drugs, this is a protein synthesis inhibitor, is a fundamental mechanism for plasticity. When we inject this drug into the amygdala, what we see is that there is a strong decrease of memory expression. In other words, this change and decrease in memory that we can manipulate during reconsolidation has to do with emotions. It has to do with the amygdala. We can decrease the emotional valence of this very strong memory. We have even shown that this requires or depends on the glucocorticoid receptors, the receptor for the stress hormones. So in other words, stressing the conclusion that it is about emotions, it is about stress, through which we can manipulate memory strength and expression. Before I conclude, I want to just mention, I'm sure I'm out of time. Good. I want to just mention one uh, topic that is very close to my heart. In the last few years, I've been very uh, interested, I became very interested in the biology of memory during development, during developmental phases. And I started by looking at infancy. I strongly believe that if we, are, if we want to understand how memory systems work, we need to understand how they develop. And we all know how important are the moments and the experiences during development, which are continuously repeated, because a baby doesn't have a choice. It's confined into his own environment. And this is how the brain shapes. What we find is that the brain shapes through experience. And the type of experience that, that the young have lead to certain types of development versus other. In other words, it is experience specific. This is what Rita was mentioning. There is no program in humans there is some program, of course, we have genes, but how we develop our abilities to interact with the world, to behave, to be able to soothe our emotions when they are negative, or to solve problems or anything in life, it's a process that is based on our experience. So understanding how during the first few years of life, these memory systems, including the emotional system, develop and crosstalk, it's a fundamental question. Uh, and very little still is known about the biology underlying this type of development. Some is known concerning the experience of traumas, but how the system develops in normal conditions from normal to pathology is unknown. This has a lot of implications, implications for education, implications for neurodevelopmental disorders, implication for the rest of our life and how we are more or less prone or uh, sensitive to certain type of pathologies. So to conclude, uh, emotions are very intertwined with everything we do, with all our memories and all our existence. Emotions are the ingredients that make our memories stored long term. The intensity of emotions dictate memory strength by regulating memory consolidation and reconsolidation. And when the emotional charge is too strong, for example in traumas, the memories involve 
a distinct set of biology. Understanding the biology underlying the development of memory emotions system link will be fundamental for understanding how we build our explicit memory system and influence our perceptions and behaviors throughout our life. And I wanna give many thanks to, to all my lab members, present and former, my collaborators, and the funding agency. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Christina, for this uh, very nice lecture. And, uh, um, and for perfect timing, there is time for one question that I call. And uh, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, I will ask. You mentioned about reconsolidation and opening a new window of fragility. So every new memory, every time you recall, it is in fact a new memory. This is by external events. You can make it fragile to external events. But what about intentional forgetting? What can, is it possible in your mind to train to forget something in the absence of external inputs? That's a very good question. Yes, it is. But I want to uh, uh, actually correct a little bit what I said. I said that memories, when they are retrieved, they become fragile, not in all conditions. There are certain conditions in which they become fragile, and one major limitation is the recency of the memory. So the memory that has been recently consolidated can become fragile. The longer we wait, the less the opportunity to have this fragility. But having said that, in theory, it's possible. The reactivation of the circuitry is not just from external uh, uh, stimuli. It can be also internally uh, activated. Viviana. Uh, is it true that memory is very creative? It changes every time through, uh, thanks to the emotions. It changes every time you recall a memory. And also the memory is not a memory. Rapid. No. Yes, yes and yes. So memories change over time because we change over time. Because our history changes, including the emotions, and therefore the emotional valence that come up with a new learning event or the retrieved memories that together update continuously our memories and who we are is gonna change. And that's why also the perception of art, as I mentioned at the beginning, changes over time. It changes with our life. Uh, are memories accurate? Not at all. In fact, as I mentioned, we mostly forget. We just need to remember what's important. And the function of memory is to remember what's important to act in the present. It's not just to have memories. We need our memories to make decisions. We need our memories to process thoughts that become at one point abstract, to make predictions. All of these functions in the present that we need absolutely to survive in the best way are fed by memories. But the long-term memories uh, are not accurate because uh, it's not needed to be accurate. We continuously update the memories with new events, and it's not just through the reconsolidation. So reconsolidation, uh, if we do not interfere with it, what it does, it strengthens the recalled memory. But it has also another function, which is make the memory labile so that in the present, no information can be linked to that. And that is a new memory. We have multiple memory traces. It's not one that changes over time. We have multiple memory traces, and when we recall them, we get a little bit confused, especially if the memory is old. I had told uh, one, only one question, but in the meantime, there are four from the floor, at least of five. Uh, can they be very rapid and very, and, and, and quick, 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 so uh, quick rapid. Uh, what are the effects of the cortisolo in very young people? Oh, that's hard for me to, <laughs> to know. Uh, we will need to look at studies in which they are under the effect of cortisol. If, you, if your question is about stress, mm, yeah. rather than yeah. cortisol, uh, you know, uh, pharmacology, uh, this is why I'm very interested in going into development. 
there are a number of studies that uh, have uh, uh, focused on traumas and very stressful event in, in, during development, and they found that not only the circuitry changes, but for example, some regions like the hippocampus remains impaired after all these stressful events. So, and court is one of the mechanisms by which this happens. So court is, uh, if continuously solicited, if the stress is high, it will reduce the ability of these regions to be plastic, and then they malfunction. But again, as I said, a lot has to be done still. Yeah. Thank you for a great talk. Um, um, about early stress and memory, is there an association or correlation with the innate immune response activation pathway? With the innate, innate immune, immune response, response pathway activation. Very interesting question. I don't know. I would guess so, but I, I don't have any knowledge of it. To be, to be studied, yes. Okay. Uh, we should, uh, I'm, I apologize with those who cannot get questions. I thank Christina, we must move on. Christina will be around. So either at the end of the session, if we save time, or do, so at the end of the session, we may have a question. So save your questions for, for, for afterwards. And uh, it's a pleasure now to talk, uh, uh, to, sorry, to call our next speaker uh, to the floor, Merav Ahistar. She is professor of psychology and brain research at the ELC Center for Brain Research of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Professor Ahissar has studied theories binding neuroscience and behavior, linking neuroscientific mechanisms and behavior, and today she will talk on the rewarding effect of beauty in the brain. So beauty gives a reward signal, and we'll discuss whether there is a specific beauty region in the brain and what triggers the perception of and, and, uh, uh, and the feelings of uh, uh, um, beauty. So please, uh, the floor is yours, thank you. Potete aiutarla col microfono per piacere? They'll come and help you. Is it good? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Viviana, for this inspiring, for organizing this inspiring event. And thank you for coming. And thank, I thank the other organizers and the amazing uh, um, short clip with Rita Levi Montalcini, which is extremely inspiring. Uh, I thought it was great. So in my talk, I will move from stress to beauty to happifying events. What is beauty? People can typically say if they find something beautiful, but have a difficult time saying why this is the case, and what is the general common thing that is common to things that we estimate as beautiful. So um, the, um, the uh, cognitive neuroscientist Samir Zeki decided that he will turn this question directly to people's brain. How does one do that? He took a series of uh, paintings and asked people to rate them as beautiful or ugly or to a varying degree. So every person had the, uh, her or his own view of whether the picture is pretty or not. Uh, for example, this uh, specific picture was typically rated as beautiful. Uh, this picture was rated as not as beautiful. It doesn't mean that it has less artistic quality. Note that the comparison is not about artistic skills, but it is about how beautiful the picture is evaluated by the viewers. And then what? And then he put people in the magnet, and he showed them a series of figures, and he compared the responses of their brain to pictures that they rated as beautiful, versus pictures that they rated as, let's say, ugly. And what does this comparison do? This contrast was aimed to focus on whether there's a specific region in the brain that is uniquely activated 
by something being beautiful, right? Because the pictures that he showed were common in activating visual regions and other regions, but he was interested in the region that is specifically activated by the comparison. This is the same region, by the way, just taken from different perspective. This is when we look at the brain from the middle, a medial view, and this is when we look from below. So this is called this region that is specific, sorry, specifically activated by being rated beautiful. It's called the medial orbitofrontal cortex, orbiter because it's just above our orbit, our eye, uh, a little inside frontal because it's a frontal region and it's cortex. So this region is specifically activated by this comparison. Then he further asked, maybe it's also obstruct this region in the sense that it will also be specific to beautiful pieces of music versus pieces of music, he presented 15 second very short clips. Some of them are rated very beautiful, others similarly artistic, etc., but not rated as beautiful. And he asked, is there a region that likes music or beauty? And what he found, if hopefully you still remember, this is a very similar region to the region that he found for our pictures, same two views, and it was really more activated the more the music piece was rated by this listener as beautiful. So he termed this region as the beauty center in the brain. This region is activated by the sense of beauty. So this is the region. This is, let's say, the beauty region. This is one perspective, medial perspective. This is below. So somewhere here, if you think I'm very beautiful, um, this is activated. Um, we can take his concept and extend it. In what way? We can further ask, well, what are the other stimuli that this region responds to, right? If we change the definition of beauty as to be determined by our brain and say, beauty is the things, or is, is defined as the things that excite this specific beauty region. Then we can ask, okay, what other things excite this region? Well, it turns out that this region is excited by many things. There's something common to all of them. So, for example, the activity of this region is enhanced by um, looking at the happy face versus intermediate face, neutral face. So, when a person is looking at us with a happy smile, this region is activated. Well, sometimes we think about happy, smiling people as more beautiful. But then it's not limited to that either. If we look at what happens to people when they participate in a game where you are expected to win some money, and then you win more than you expected. You're happy, and this region is excited. So what's going on? What's common to the things that excite this region? So if we further broaden our perspective of this region, and we ask, OK, what is this region part of? It turns out that this region this uh, uh, medial uh, orbitofrontal region is part of a general system in the brain that is called the reward circuitry, which is composed of several interconnected regions activated when we are exposed to something we want to be repeated. So when this region is activated as part of the reward system, it excites us to seek to do something again to seek for a repetition of what we just experienced. And typically, the reward system is explained from an evolutionary perspective. Why do we have it? What are primary rewards like water, food, sex? In a way, we think about this system as something that is evolutionary very important because it helps us repeat the kind of actions that will prolong our uh, personal existence, but also that of next generations, because it promotes our, uh, our gene, a good gene, or sort of more surviving genes. It also contains conditional rewards. These are things we are not born to appreciate, but we learn to appreciate, like money. We learn to think about it as rewarding effect, and if we get something with a positive feedback. And beautiful faces excite this region as part of this system. Does this help us define what is beautiful? So is it innate? Remember, the reward system uh, uh, is excited both by innate rewards, by acquired rewards. 
Is beauty an innate kind of reward? And if not, if it's learned, how is it learned? So there were several views about this concept. One, for instance, I would call it a romantic view, which is, yes, there are the innate ratios, golden ratios, which are written somewhere, perhaps genetically so, that make us feel that this is something beautiful. It has the adequate ratios. However, as years go by, we to some extent become less romantic. What do I mean by that? We think that beauty, to a large extent, is in the eye of the beholder. So what people 300 years ago, 200 years ago thought is beautiful is not necessarily what we think now is beautiful, and things change. What is common to all the things that throughout the ages we think of as beautiful? Um, I would like to uh, propose that what is common is part of the reward system is other things that are evolutionarily advantageous. So beauty is an honest signaling of evolutionary fitness. For example, I would like to give you some examples and then suggest how it can work. Uh, for example, we like smooth faces. And we say, yeah, this is very beautiful. But if we think about the evolutionary perspective, perhaps it means that these are faces that were less corrupted by parasites, for example, and this is good. This is a good evidence that the person with these face is more resilient to parasites, and that's good. That's good for mating. That's good for the genes of the next generation. So individuals are attracted to those having face traits, which are associate, associated with a parasite resistance. And it's smooth, and we think about it as beautiful. One can define it as sort of a good signal for resilience from an evolutionary perspective. Um, if we look further, more specifically, at the traits that it turns out, following many studies, that we like. One of them is symmetry, okay? So this, sorry, these are just uh, made up uh, uh, by sort of modifying uh, uh, by computer programs the faces, and we ask people which they like more. It's not my own experiments. And people prefer the more symmetric faces. There's a preference for symmetry, again, it turns out to be, in a minute, the preference for, I don't know if it's beautiful, somewhere in between. Um, I'm thinking which areas in my brain are excited by beyond my auditory cortices. But anyhow, the preference for symmetry was found to be very broad. It's found in African hunter-gatherers, meaning it's not a cultural, Western cultural preference. It's even found in insects attraction, and even in macaque, the way they, how do you ask macaque what he prefers, what she prefers, by the amount of time they devote to looking at different, uh, at different pictures. And they devote more time to pictures they like more, for example, symmetric. So um, what is the uh, advantage of symmetrical faces? Again, it turns out that there is some uh, uh, evolutionary benefit to that. I will get to it in a minute. Another characteristic which I find extremely interesting is our liking for averages. Averages sounds average, sound mediocre. But when I talk about average, I mean the summation of all similar experiences that we had. What is the evolutionary advantage of this summation? So first, let me give you some example. Uh, so this is uh, uh, taken from an experiment. These are three faces. They seem very similar, but they are averaged across a different number of similar faces. So the question is, which do you like the most? And uh, A is a composition from three images. Sorry. This is a composition from three images. This is from nine with some aspects, and this is from nine with other aspects, which suggests that you are expected to like most the one which is averaged over more uh, faces, which is C. I don't know. I will not ask you. Never take a chance with demos. They tend not to work when you're in a large. Uh, uh, uh. But I will go, I'll give you another example. So these are faces. Again, you see the top row 
and the bottom row, they're taken from two women, two men, different colors. But what separates between the rows is the amount of averaging that was used to create the two uh, lines of these figures. What do you like better? I'm not asking as yourself, but I will tell you what is expected to be liked better. So these are average over five uh, faces, and the bottom row is over average over 20 faces. So expected to slightly like the, uh, the you know, they're all complementary. So this slightly more than that, slightly more than that, slightly more than that, slightly more than that, because they're average over more faces, I see by your faces that I can take the chances of asking if it works. Thank you. <laughs> so does, average, does preference for averaging have an evolutionary advantage? I would like to say yes. It has two types of advantages. Why? First, because, sorry, oh, uh, first, I didn't mean to do that. This gives you the next one. First, because it means that we like better things, features, composition of features that we've been exposed to more than others. So what? Well, think. What are the things we are more likely to be exposed to? Things that have an evolutionary advantage. Hence, the more of them, the more abundant, and therefore, we are more likely to be exposed to them. So the concept, in a way, the evolutionary concept of our liking, the average, which is the summation of features that we have been exposed to, means that you like more the aspects that are more likely to be beneficial evolutionarily, and hence they're more abundant. Where are they more abundant? At your own vicinity, which is the second advantage. You don't need to have innate preferences. All you need to have is preferences for the average, for the summation of things we've been most exposed to. Because the kind of things that are beneficial to us probably change across different regions, across the ages. But what is common is that the most abundant features are those that are more uh, uh, resilient to all sorts of challenges within your own vicinity. So this is an internal mechanism of statistical learning that automatically allows us to adapt to changing constraints of the environment and hence like those that are most resilient, most advantageous throughout the ages and throughout the regions. So to summarize, by learning the statistics of our external world and preferring familiar structures, we prefer both familiar specific faces, but more importantly, the sum of features that have been most resilient and hence we've been most exposed to. So this is an evolutionarily beneficial strategy. The more resilient stimuli and features are those we see most. These are the genetically surviving uh, uh, specimens in a way. Um, so this means that the ideal beauty is not the face one, this is important, one has been most exposed to by the accumulative sum, right? The average is not, aha, this is a winner, it's the summation of all the faces, just as the examples that I showed you. The more faces are summed, the more we kind of average across the, the, the specific aspects that are specific to one face, but they're unique, they're not necessarily common, not necessarily advantageous, and we like the features of the survivors, the accumulative sum of these features. So just to summarize the points I was trying to make, beauty yields pleasure. It activates the reward system in the brain. And what it means is that we act to have more of that. This, to some, to some extent, explains our sort of addictive uh, attraction to beautiful faces. This is what the reward system does. It also takes an important part in other addictions. Some we like, some we don't like, but this kind of uh, reward system to a large extent governs our life, governs what we do, but it has an evolutionary advantage because um, we typically uh, uh, are attracted, are excited in these regions by uh, uh, acts that will promote our evolutionary resilience. Um, so just the last point, what rewards us are stimuli that we are familiar with, following massive exposures. So this means that beauty is culture dependent. 
in an evolutionarily beneficial way because it is a good thing, go and enjoy, but then try not to be over addicted, which is kind of talking about the, uh, the, the, the uh, function that was presented in the second one. Don't go to the other side. Try to go and stay at the peak. It's challenging, but many things are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. Also for perfect timing. So there is time for questions. Madam Andali. Good morning. Um, there is any evidence about the um, the possibility to lose the perception of beauty with, per, for example, lesion of the prefrontal cortex, uh, the, the brain areas you were mentioning before? Uh, this is the question? Yes. <laughs> well, if we lose our frontal regions, we have lots of difficulties. I don't know about beauty. It probably is part of the package, but this is the smallest part, I would think. I mean, that's, that's one of the points I was making is that, you know, Zeki talked about the specific beauty region, but this region is crucial in evaluation of the benefits of all sorts of reward, and this evaluation is very important for us in a range of activities. So if, if, if this region is destroyed, we're expected to have difficulties in gaining advantage and evaluating beneficial stimuli, including, but not limited to beauty. There is a question over here. Aspetta, due secondi. Uh, how the cultural background can influence this, uh, the perception, I, I, I cultural heard. background can influence, cultural. cultural background can influence the perception of beauty? How can it influence, how does cultural background. background influence the perception of beauty? Um, so this is a trick question. <laughs> Why is it a trick question? Because following what I've said in my talk, it follows that different cultures we have, will have a different beauty models, which depends on the experiences that people had. So people would like, let's say, in, in where, where I grew up would have a, an ideal, which is the summation of the faces that I have seen, which is kind of have the specific color, have the specific uh, 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 characteristic, and is advantageous where I grew up. Can I push it to be the only answer I give? Not really. I was, I, 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 uh, for example, once a person asked me, why do we like blondes? How does it fall within the same concept? And, and at least natively, uh, blonde probably was not the most abundant color that you saw at the age of, let's say, 20 years and above. And people like blondes, even in environments that blonde is definitely not the kind of uh, uh, most abundant hair color that they see in their environment. So first, I don't have a really good answer for that. But second, I can see the advantage. Well, but, and then second order, I have two answers. One is once you like something, um, you have it abundantly because most of the faces that we are exposed to are not the faces we meet on the street, are faces of models, are faces that we look at the internet, and then it kind of affects our preferences. And to some extent, it's common now across cultures because oh, so many, so billions of people have access to the internet. I think a lot of them use the time to see top models in various uh, uh, perspectives. Um, by the way, we tried to, um, to do an experiment with, with, with known figures, both at the front, and we looked at for models because the, the most known uh, faces, and we had difficulties finding specific uh, uh, perspectives for models, for models. It turns out that even though I was completely unaware of it, they make sure that some non-complementing perspectives are never there in spite of having zillions of pictures. But then, yes, and I think it does modify our preferences, and this is why I think fashion companies are now being forced to, and do to some extent, introduce 
some viability in the proportions of the models that they present, because the, uh, the, 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 the additional question is, so how do we change things? Because this is only a mechanism that prefers what has been good so far. But can we, can we modify preferences? And I think we can do that. And some outliers, which is sort of not the average, some outliers do get benefits. I am not sure how this mechanism works. So I think there is a preference for the average. But some specific outliers are also liked. It's a long answer, but. Thank you, Mayra. And, uh, and, uh, so we now move on. Uh, dopo, mi spiace. <laughs> Dobbiamo andare. Eh, chiamo, we have now back to a piece of music. Quindi chiamo la musicista maestra. So Agnese Coco. La Sarabanda come struttura. As a structure and, gen and genre was developed for a ballet, and Nido Rota devoted it to Clelia Gatti, and uh, who worked a lot for the art for this uh, specific instrument during the 40s, thanks to the concerts performed when we didn't have too many women uh, involved. Well, a uh, huge importance was given to ARP because up to that moment it was considered as an accompanying uh, instrument. So the one that accompanied the noble ones. But therefore, the fact that many uh, important musicians devoted works to her represented a con an important contribution to the development of this instrument. Thank you.
aspetti, aspetti, aspetti. Volevo... Hold on, I just wanted to thank you, but also to ask a question. Uh, so, uh, ARP is actually played by uh, women musicians. Um, is this true? And could you please tell us why? In a mic, please. Thank you. Well, presently, especially in Italy, um, we have a lot of women. And I believe that the reason is actually what I mentioned before. That is to say, it was um, developed as a uh, something from the uh, salon, so accompanying other uh, instruments. And uh, that is the reason why this is quite reasoned as a structure and also as a repertoire. We're talking about the end of the uh, 19th, beginning of the 20th centuries. And also, uh, for instance, the musicians that um, composed for it were quite late. So this was mainly played by women, um, for instance, uh, in the salon or in any case uh, in uh, particular meetings. But a lot of men have become passionate for it. And it also requires a lot of physical strength as well. Uh, and also abroad, I have to say. But in Italy, we mostly have uh, women playing this um, instrument. Thank you. Thank you so much for this curiosity. Music, we now have a talk also about music, and uh, it's a pleasure to call on stage Virginia Penhuon. She's professor and chair of the Department of Psychology at Concordia University. And um, her research explores the neural basis of human motor skill learning, amongst other topics, using structural and functional neuroimaging. And uh, she also has studied a lot musical training and uh, individuals with musical training. And she was a founding member of the Montreal Laboratory for Brain, Music and Sound, Brahms, which is, I find, a beautiful name for th such a center. And today she will talk on musical groove, the intersection of pleasure and movement. Please. Thank you so much. I'm extremely pleased to be here today. I really would love to uh, thank uh, Viviane Kassam. I'm uh, very appreciative of the opportunity to come and also to thank uh, the uh, EBRI and uh, Brain Circle Italia. Uh, and I will just say that uh, I too find uh, the words of uh, Rita Levi Montalcini to be very uh, inspirational. And I'll also uh, thank, I think, uh, a long history of neuroscience in Italy uh, that was certainly an inspiration to me when I uh, first began my degree in Montreal because I was very uh, interested in neuroanatomy and in also the uh, brain structures that are related to movement. And that's something uh, that uh, Italian neuroscience has really brought to the fore. So what I would like to talk to you about today is uh, a concept that we call musical groove. Um, and I want to ask the question, why does listening to a rhythm make us want to move? So I thought we should have an example of this kind of music from one of the students in my lab who is part of a Brazilian drumming group. So if I can have this music, I think this will get us all moving. that you would like to move along. And especially, in just a moment, we're gonna get this really nice drum break, right? And you can hear, and if you weren't stuck in your seats, you would be able to dance along too, right? So what is it? What is happening in our brain that makes us want to move to this kind of music? And it's not just this kind of clearly rhythmic music we can hear this kind of sensation or feel this sensation of wanting to move uh, when we listen to something like this beautifully played saraband uh, that we just had. So I'd like to talk to you about the idea that what makes us want to move and what gives us that pleasure when we listen to this kind of music is something about predictions our brain making predictions 
about what is going to happen next in the music. So when we listen to a piece of music, we're constantly making predictions. We're making predictions about what is going to happen, what's the next pitch that we're going to hear, and we're also making predictions about when it's going to happen, when is that note, next note going to happen, and what we think, what I think, is that when we try to make a prediction about when is something going to happen, we make a prediction using our body, using movement, even if we don't actually move. And I'll also try to convince you, or I won't convince you, but I think that our experience of these predictions is built sort of like what Mirav was talking about on our experience of music in our culture. So we hear music all around us and when we hear that music, we acquire a sample. We hear lots of different kinds of music, and this allows us to make predictions about both that what and that when. And the kinds of predictions that we're able to make depend on the kind of music that we hear. So if I'm not familiar with a particular type of music, I'll probably be less accurate, less able to make a prediction about what's happening in that music. And one of the things that we think is that there is a tension between our ability to make a prediction, how accurately we can make that prediction, and what really happens in the music that drives pleasure and movement. So if music is too predictable, if we know exactly what's going to happen, like a children's song, we don't find that very exciting. We don't find that very enjoyable. And it yields no surprise. It yields no learning. So we enjoy it less. Surprise is important because if we hear something new, we, it doesn't fit with what we've heard before. We want to learn more about it. It has an in, intrinsic rewarding property. Learning is inherently rewarding, as I just said. And so, for many different kinds of art, I think as we saw before, you also showed from memory, there's kind of a sweet spot where some sort of complexity, surprise, yields learning and yields pleasure. So I'll go on to kind of try to tell you a little bit more about this in detail. But first, I'm going to tell you about the brain. Why might we engage both the motor system and this reward or pleasure system when we're listening to music that makes us want to move. So first, there are pathways that link the auditory regions of the brain here, conveniently located right above your ears, to both the frontal lobe and to motor regions of the brain. And this pathway that goes from auditory system to frontal is very important for these what or pitch predictions. And this dorsal pathway that goes from auditory cortex to the parietal lobe to motor and motor association regions of the brain is very important for timing. So there's a link between timing, between when something's going to happen, and movement. There are another set of structures that are linked in to these cortical motor regions that come from the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia can be broken up into at least uh, three major systems. The first emanates from the putamen here that is linked to these motor cortical regions and is important, we think, for movement prediction and movement initiation. There's another stream from the caudate that's important for making higher order predictions. So when I have a, a, a musical rhythm, I don't have necessarily a completely regular, entirely predictable pattern of sounds. I have 
a, uh, a, an idea of a global musical or rhythmic structure. And that may be something that is uh, housed in the frontal lobe. And it's this link between the caudate and the frontal cortex that may be important for these higher order predictions. And then finally, very importantly, we have the ventral striatum, which is linked to uh, the frontal cortex, and in particular, the oral orbital frontal cortex that Marav brought up. Uh, and this is important for reward predictions. There's also another system that's quite important that is very near and dear to my heart, which is the uh, cerebellum. Uh, we'll talk less about this today, but we think that this is important for generating these models and for, uh, for evaluating error. So how do these brain systems work together uh, to help us make these predictions in time? So some of this research really started uh, quite a, a while ago with one of my students, Joyce Chen, uh, who is now a professor at the University of Toronto. And what we did is we were interested in looking at what regions of the brain were engaged when you listened to and then uh, reproduced musical rhythms. So what she did is she created a set of rhythms that varied uh, in how complex they were, how rhythmically easy they were to reproduce. And she had people listen to them and then listen to them again and try to tap along in time with them. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to do Joyce's task. I'll ask you to play the very first rhythm. OK, so there's the rhythm. You're going to hear it again. So if you imagined yourself trying to tap along with that, that was reasonably perhaps easy to do. But if I play you one of the, like the second one, if you can play that. So this is a bit more difficult to tap along to. So what she had people do, as I said, is you listen, then you hear it again, and you try to tap along. And at the same time, we measured activity in the brain while people were doing this task. And what we found is if we look at the regions of the brain that are active when you're tapping along to those rhythms, you can see these motor cortical regions, the premotor cortex, the supplementary motor area, but also the basal ganglia, so those subcortical regions and the cerebellum. So this is perhaps not surprising, right? You've listened to these rhythms, and now you're listening to them, and you're moving. So we asked a second question. Well, what is happening when you listen to that rhythm, but before you tap along with it? So this is listening, and then you're anticipating. You know you're going to have to tap along with them next. So what? Are, what regions of the brain are engaged when you're listening and preparing. And we see, again, these motor cortical regions and the cerebellum. We don't see the basal ganglia here, perhaps because you're not actually initiating a movement. Now, this was really exciting to us to see these motor regions engaged even when people weren't making a movement. But of course, you guys can all ask the same question. Well, you already told me, right? They're getting ready. They're going to move. Maybe they're just imagining themselves moving. So we brought back a new set of participants who had not done this experiment before. We put them in the scanner, and we asked them simply to listen to these rhythms. And this is what we found that very similar cortical regions and regions of the cerebellum were active when people were listening to these rhythms and they had no intent to move. So what this tells us is that those motor regions and perhaps some of those subcortical basal ganglia regions are active when we listen to a musical rhythm 
even if we have no intent of moving. So this tells us about that part of motor regions being engaged in musical timing, but it doesn't tell us about that component of pleasure. Why is it that when we hear those rhythms, not only do we feel the urge to move along, but that, that is a very pleasurable feeling, right? You only need to go uh, to a wedding. And uh, when people put on some kind of dancing music, you know, everybody gets up from little children to grandmas, right? It's very pleasurable. So the way we decided to look at this is uh, to look at this concept of musical groove. And this is uh, an idea that was first talked about by uh, Peter Janata. And what he did is he asked people to listen to a whole uh, series of uh, musical pieces, little excerpts that are come mostly from uh, American soul and popular music, and to tell us, to rate for us, how much pleasure does it give you and how much does it make you want to move. And he really so first defined this construct of groove that combines pleasure and wanting to move. And he'll see there are a couple of uh, these songs in here that some of you might recognize. I think particularly uh, Lady Marmalade that uh, Christina Aguilera did. Um, my, you know, many people's favorite Stevie Wonder superstition. You can all imagine dancing to that. And there are lots of examples uh, from, as I said, uh, things like uh, hip hop, soul, but also you can think of more traditional types of music uh, like uh, perhaps the tarantella here in Italy uh, or salsa music or other types of music. And we'll talk about, well, what makes them groovy? So I'll just first say, too, this is work that was done with uh, Peter Wust, with my uh, PhD student, Thomas Matthews, and uh, Maria Vitek. So what is it about these particular uh, pieces of music or music like that that makes them groovy, makes you want to move? And what we think is that what makes them groovy is syncopation. So music that has uh, a rhythm that is not 100% regular is rated overall as giving you a stronger feeling of wanting to move and a stronger feeling of pleasure. So this is telling you how syncopated is the music. So this is very little syncopation. This is very high syncopation, so very complicated rhythms. And what you see is this U-shaped function where rhythms that are in the middle that have a, a, a certain amount of syncopation but not too much are rated as more pleasurable, uh, sorry, more pleasurable and generating a greater desire to move. So what is it about syncopation? So I'm gonna give you uh, just an example, if you don't mind playing it. That's great. So you can hear this is a moderately syncopated, this is like a clave kind of uh, Brazilian rhythm. And what you can see is if you look at the notation is that here is the predicted beat point here. And a syncopated rhythm has uh, points in the music where there's no sound uh, on the beat point, where the prediction is not 100% easy or obvious from the sound that's coming in. So what we think is that in very, very simple rhythms, like if you think of a child's, uh, children's kind of music, there's no syncopation, so your ability to predict what's coming next is kind of perfect, it's 100%. So there's no error, there's no surprise. You don't need to engage your motor system because you know what's coming next. It's completely predictable. There's nothing to learn. There's nothing new in this pattern. And that means there's no reward 
There's no pleasure. So learning is itself intrinsically rewarding to us as humans. So when there's deviation, we want to learn from it, and there's a reward there. If the rhythm is too syncopated, if it's too unpredictable, and I'll give you an example in a moment, you have extremely poor ability to predict. You can't tell what's going to happen. So if you think of some crazy jazz piece, right? you can't tell what's coming next. Or it's one of the problems that some people find with uh, very contemporary music. They can't tell what's going to happen. Very poor prediction. It means that there are lots of errors. You're making lots of mistakes because you're trying to predict, but it's uninformative. It doesn't help you figure out what's going on. This generates less urge to move, lower learning, little pleasure. So the idea is this minimum, uh, this medium, excuse me, syncopation is that sweet spot, right, where you have a moderate ability to predict. You can make a prediction. There's error, but it tells you something. There's surprise. It generates this urge to move. It gives us pleasure. So now what we did with this is we wanted to look at where in the brain, or can we see these regions of the brain that we think are important for both pleasure or reward and movement in this uh, experience of groove? So we know from previous research, particularly from the lab of Jessica Gran, that these regions that I talked about before that are in the dorsal auditory stream and these basal ganglia regions are active when people listen to uh, rhythms that have a stronger musical beat. So here we see the basal ganglia, but also premotor cortex, SMA, uh, and uh, the auditory regions. Further, we know from the work uh, of uh, Valerie Salampour and Robert Zatori that regions uh, that are engaged in that reward network are active when people hear music that gives them the chills. So some of you may have this experience when you hear a piece of music or you hear, usually it's a certain section in a piece of music and you can get you know, uh, tingles in your spine, you might get slightly sweaty fingers. It's a, it's a peak pleasurable experience to music. And what you see in those studies it's that regions of this reward network, particularly the ventral striatum, are engaged when people have this peak chills experience. But also the putamen, remember I said that this links to the, the motor regions of the brain and the caudate, which linked to the frontal cortex. So what we did is we looked at uh, rhythms that were either moderately complex, so like that one that I just played, if you don't mind playing it again. Right? And then we compared it, if you can stop that one, and play the next one. And that's good, thank you there. So that second one you can hear, you can make some predictions, but it's much more difficult to follow. So we called those moderate complexity rhythms the high groove rhythms, and we compared them to those more complex, less groovy rhythms. And we did this with musicians and non-musicians, and we also measured their, uh, act, uh, the activity of their brains when they were in the scanner, and we asked them to rate how much pleasure did they get, and how much did these uh, rhythms make them want to move? So fortunately, uh, excuse me, for us, we were able to see that those medium complexity or medium syncopation rhythms were rated as higher in both wanting to move and pleasure than these higher syncopation rhythms. And what we saw in the brain is that if we compared activity uh, between these high groove and low groove rhythms, what we showed is these same regions of the motor cortex, so supplementary motor order, uh, area, premotor cortex, and the basal ganglia were all active for these high groove rhythms. 
but we wanted to know a little bit more about these specifically reward-related regions in the basal ganglia. So what we did is we identified these regions, so broke down this area into ventral striatum, putamen, and caudate, and we looked at uh, the relationship between the activity in those specific regions and uh, rhythmic complexity. And what we saw is that for the ventral striatum, so this reward-related part of the basal ganglia, again, it was higher, uh, activity was higher for these medium syncopation or high groove rhythms. But the same was really the case as well for the putamen and the caudate. So next, what we tried to do was to look at the relationship between activity in these particular regions and uh, the ratings that people gave. And what we saw is that for the ventral striatum, this reward-related area, the activity in the region was more related to pleasure, to ratings of pleasure, and that for the putamen and the caudate, activity was more related to uh, the experience of wanting to move. So what this is telling us overall is that both motor and reward-related regions are engaged by these groovy stimuli, and that we have uh, some evidence for a dissociation between these ventral striatum regions and uh, the experience of pleasure and these more dorsal regions of the uh, caudate and wanting to move. So I can see that I've got exactly 36 seconds left. So what I'll say is that high groove rhythms generate an optimal rhythmic prediction that engage motor and reward networks, and they drive both pleasure uh, and wanting to move. And that we think that these different Subcircuits are important for different aspects. So this more motor circuit related to representation of the beat, this more frontal cortex region uh, circuit related to metrical predictions, and this circuit between the, uh, the ventral striatum and the orbital frontal cortex that monitors and assigns uh, affective value. Next steps. We want to think about whether these are uh, separable percepts. How are they experienced in the body? Think more about groove and dance. And I'll just stop here and thank all of my collaborators, the funding organizations, and I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you, Virginia, for this fascinating talk. So I learned that during music perception, there is a short-term memory system that is going on and that makes you predicting what will come next. So this is an engagement into the future. So we are doing mind time travel whilst we listen to music. Yeah, maybe uh, w I wouldn't think of it in terms of time travel. I would think of it in terms of you have a representation about musical structures that you've learned from your experiences in your musical environment. And you use that memory, uh, that structure, to make predictions about the music that you hear coming in. Yeah. Thank you. One quick question. One. And quick. One. I'm sorry. It's my fault. <laughs> I talked too long. I got too excited. But, but Virginia, again, as all speakers, is around. There is a coffee break. And after, we shall, if we have time, we can take questions again. Yeah. Mm. Do you think that uh, intrinsic body rhythms, such as heartbeats, can play a role in the perception of groove and musical pleasure in general? I think um, heartbeat is not something I know about, but people think that uh, intrinsic rhythms like the, the rhythm that we walk at. So if you look across cultures, uh, the, uh, the common beat rate is at approximately two hertz, which is around the uh, rate uh, of walking. And it makes a lot of sense because we probably think that uh, evolutionarily, uh, rhythms uh, were generated either by dancing, stomping, you know, uh, hitting an object. And so it's gonna take into account the physical uh, 
uh, constraints of your limbs, which move it about that pace. Yeah. So I will so stop thank here. Thank you very much. And now, before calling the coffee break, uh, I ju uh, just one announcement. Uh, we had one speaker, Eva Yablonka, who could not make it because of personal uh, uh, reasons. And she is professor at the Sagol School of Neuroscience in Tel Aviv and at the Social Science in London School of Economics. For those who are in streaming, uh, the, the, the recorded uh, talk of uh, Eva Yablonska is going, uh, will, will go online now. For those of you who want to listen to it, it ca uh, you can re um, uh, listen to it afterwards on the replay. And so now there is coffee break, 20 minutes sharp, please. 20 minuti esatti, please come back. Esattamente tra 20 minuti. Please come back exactly in 20 minutes, thank you. I will start this lecture by asking what is the sense of beauty? What are aesthetic judgments and how do we make them? I present an approach that is inspired by Kant. Then I ask how do biologists, especially evolutionary biologists, approach the question of animals' aesthetic judgment? And I draw here mainly on Darwin and on Prum, Richard Prum, who studied the evolution of beauty in animals. Then I want to discuss very briefly the grounding of the aesthetic sense, the sensory and cognitive biases and possibilities they open up, the desires and the cultural affordances that together shape our human, uh, our human aesthetic judgments. I then would like to say something about the explanatory power of the beautiful in scientific explanation. And here I draw on the work of an ex-student of mine, Shani Inbar. And I will end with our personal journey, using visual art to explore the science of consciousness. The screen again has appeared. I haven't done anything. I Sandra? saw. I saw. Yeah, I saw. Uh, I, I, I have an idea. So what do we do? do we, shall PM. I do it? Shall no. I do it with the PDF? Maybe it won't no, do no, it. No, 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 no. I have an idea. I can, I can fix it. So don't, don't worry about that from by okay. now. Don't worry about that and go straight. Okay, so you will edit this, yes, of course. Yes, 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 yes. I, I'll do that. I'll do that. Okay. Okay. So I start with Kant. Kant published the critique, or the third critique, which includes the critique of aesthetic judgment in 1790. And he suggested that when we encounter patterns that display an order, which does not fit a pre-existing framework that cannot be subsumed under a pre-existing concept, our recognition of this unexplained order and the free play of imagination that it induces give us pleasure, excite us, and inspire us. And this is the basis of our critique of, of a, our, aesthetic, our critique of our judgment of aesthetic of, of, of beauty. The pleasure of recognizing, exploring, and searching for the meaning of such patterns is grounded, he suggested, in the shared sensibilities of the community. This, sh this shared sensibilities include sensory affordances, the way that our sensory organs are built, the cogn cognitive affordances, the way that our brains work, our cognitive capacities, in the human case, the free play of imagination, and the affordances of the cultural, uh, cultural zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. This shared sensibilities render our judgment of taste communicable. It's not just, I like it, but I don't know if you like it or not, everything is relative to me and subjective. No, this is something communicable. And this gives our experience of the beautiful a normative value. Everyone should enjoy it. Everyone should appreciate it. Now, Kant was very much interested and focused on human aesthetic judgment and specifically on the cognitive side, 
uh, side of it. He, he thought of aesthetic judgment as something that is disinterested, that gives a full range, a full, a full stage to the free play of imagination. However, biologists, when they thought about it, and they were thinking about animals, so they thought in a slightly different way. Do animals have a taste for the beautiful? Darwin suggested that they, yes, they do. They said that they have a, an aesthetic faculty, a taste for the beautiful that is exercised, for example, and mainly during the choosing of a mate. This is the basis of the evolution of ornamental traits in animals, he suggested. Such ornaments, he said, are evolutionary products of cumulative selection driven by evaluation based on the taste for the beautiful. So what you see here is a gray female fish who is scrutinizing a very beautiful male who is displaying for her. And what Darwin suggested was that the beautiful pattern that we see on the male are the product of cumulative process of choices during evolution, choices by females who like this type of variability, who like this type of patterns. So the object of choice, he suggested, and others suggested, may have been initially indicators of biological quality. For example, bright colors can indicate the vigor of, uh, of the male and its health. But they may also have been chosen because of the whims of the chooser, because this is how she felt about it at that time. However, since there is cup between the exhibited property that is displayed and the preference for it, they co-evolve. With mate choice, exaggerated male ornaments and the preference of the female for extravagance will both be transmitted to their offspring. And that may lead to a kind of positive feedback, to extravagant attractive traits that have no utility beyond their attractiveness. These views, the idea that, they that there is no utility beyond their attractiveness, resonates with this, the intuition that Kant also had, that art and beauty go beyond direct utility. The exploration of patterns is driven, according to the biologist, by desire and by the joy of seeking. And here is what uh, uh, Darwin said, his own words. He who admits the principle of sexual selection will be led to the remarkable conclusion that the cerebral system not only regulates most of the existing functions of the body, but has indirectly influenced the progressive development of various bodily structures and of certain mental qualities. Courage, pugnacity, perseverance, strength, and size of body weapons of all kinds, musical organs, both vocal and instrumental, bright colors, stripes and marks and ornamental appendages have all been indirectly gained by the one sex or the other through the influence of love and jealousy, through the appreciation of the beautiful in sound, color, or from and through the exertion of choice. And these powers of the mind manifestly depend on the development of the cerebral system. And what we see on the right, one uh, in the, one of Anna's uh, pictures, all the pictures here are hers, we see the male white spotted puffer fish who constructs on the seabed a two meter wide sand circle with a very complex symmetrical internal pattern. It decorates this structure with shell fragments and brings fine sand particles into the innermost central area of the circle into which the female will lay eggs if she deems the mandala-like structure that we see here good enough. Now, we agree with, uh, with Darwin that in order to, to make this type of selection, to select and choose this kind of ornament, this kind of patterns, consciousness is ne needed. Subjective experiencing is needed. And we argued at, at, at great length that animals that can discriminate among different complex images and patterns of action and that can make choices among them are subjectively experiencing animals. Such animals have subjective experience both of the pattern that they perceive as well as the subjective experience of their evaluation of these patterns, for example, pleasure. They actually feel pleasure. The choices they make on the basis of their experiences can lead to the evolution of intricate, ever more enjoyable and desirable patterns. 
the, there are many examples for that, but the complex patterns on the body of the male fish that we saw earlier would evolve only if females could discriminate among variant patterns and prefer some to others. They can make very fine discriminations and give them value. The evolution of the visual and olfactory patterns of flowers depended on the ability of insects and birds to discriminate among visual and olfactory patterns. It is no coincidence that unlike animal pollinated flowers, wind pollinated flowers have no complex visual patterns and smells. The wind that pollinates them has no consciousness. But insects and birds do have subjective experiences. So at the top here on the right, we see insect pollinated flower. And on the bottom, we see a wind pollinated flower, which is white and very simple in, st in structure. Richard Prum is an ornithologist who studies the extraordinary sexual displays of birds. And he wrote a book about the evolution of beauty, of, of beauty in the animal world. He suggests that we should consider the complex patterns in the animal world as a form of art. And he says, art consists of a form of communication that co-evolves with its own evaluation. For example, again, the form of the flower and the sensory systems and judgments of the pollinators have co-evolved with each other. The song of the May nightingale co-evolved with the aesthetic judgments of the female, the musical aesthetic judgments of the female. Biological art, like human art, is a community population phenomenon. It is something that happens over time in a population of evaluators and, our, and exhibitors, producers. What we consider as art is very context and history dependent. Think, for example, about cubism and futurism in 20th century art, visual art, which would not have been considered art in the 18th century. So it's very, very dependent on the context, the intellectual, cultural context in which one lives, social context, of course. Prum says, art and aesthetics are emergent consequences of ad advertisement communication, evaluation, choice, and evolutionary, and I would add, or historical feedback. They cannot be reduced to more fundamental processes. However, it is very clear for every biologist who thinks a little bit about it, that not all biotic advertisements are beautiful. You can advertise also something that is disgusting because you want other animals to get away from you. For example, to, to be afraid of you, to avoid, avoid attacking you. The beautiful, also the beautiful, according to Prum, also requires positive sensory engagement of the evaluator. It requires attraction, pleasure, joy. And he says, because attraction and engagement are the most efficient contexts for the maintenance of coevolutionary process, beauty is the overwhelmingly predominant aesthetic property in both biotic and human aesthetics. Beauty is predominant because positive aesthetic engagement will foster the most persistent, detailed, and profound forms of the coevolutionary interaction that drive all aesthetic process. In other words, Beauty is the null or default aesthetic property of art. Now, I will not go into all the various kinds of sensory biases that people recognize as important for the evaluation of beauty in humans and in animals. Among them are symmetry, variability, brightness of color, and so on. I want to look at one particular uh, bias, which is interesting, which was discovered by Heinrich Kluver, an early 20th century German psychologist. He documented how his visual field changed under the influence of a hallucinogen. He saw recurring patterns, lattices, tunnels, spirals, and cobwebs. These patterns, he argued, were similar to shapes commonly found in ancient cave drawings. They're also similar to the mandalas that symbolize the self in many cultures. And we see a, an example of it. Uh, on the right hand side. It is argued that these patterns stem from the way that the visual part of the brain is organized in humans and other animals. This is uh, uh, not, this, not the work of Kluver, but the work that followed Kluver. The connections among neurons in the visual area, the connections in the brain, 
give rise to these patterns only when the activity of the brain is spontaneous and no longer dominated by signals that come from the world. It happens uh, during mystical experiences, under the influence uh, of uh, hallucinogens and uh, in other extreme co uh, circumstances, also in dreams. It is a very strong shared cognitive bias that uncovers some of our aesthetic appreciations. Now, when we think about animals, we tend to think about this sensory biases and cognitive biases. We don't think about cultural biases because not many of us recognize the fact that animals actually have their own cultures. So here is an example of bowerbirds. Bowerbirds are birds that are found, uh, in, among other places, in New Guinea. And the male bowerbird, the bluebird on the right, constructs a bower for the females to, uh, uh, to the female, and it decorates both the bower and the surrounding of the bower. And the female comes and scrutinizes it and looks if it's up to her standards. Now, what is very interesting here is the different populations of the same species have different styles of bowers. So some of the bowers are more kind of gray, black, uh, brown colors, very elegant and tall. Others have a lot more flowers decorating them and different colors of flowers and so on. And the female will find the bower of her own community attractive. She will not be very impressed by a bower of a different, uh, of a different population. So different populations have different bower styles, and the females, the, uh, the males create different, different forms of art, and the females have preferences for these particular forms of art of their own community. When we think about humans, of course, everything in humans is, uh, is multidimensional and complicated, very much more complicated than in other animals. It's an entangled web of sensory, cultural, economic, and religious affordances. And here is an example that is shown in this figure. Uh, the domestication of the pepper 6,000 years ago by the uh, Mexican people. The Mexican people selected for size, for taste, for smell, for visual variety, and for beauty. The outcome reflected and reinforced the agricultural, social, artistic, and religious symbolic values and practices of the people. Their aesthetic judgments reflect this entangled web of interactions. That is true for many, many different things. But what about science? What is the role of beauty in the process of scientific uh, development? Scientists often talk about the beauty of a discovery or the beauty of a theory. Is it just a figure of speech? I don't think it's just a figure of speech. I think that aesthetic judgment plays a very important role, of, uh, role in science. And I draw on the research of my ex-student, Shanine Barr, who, uh, who, who studied this subject. This, I, it is said in the Babylonian Talmud in the name of the Amora Rabbi Hanina, I learned much from my teachers and from my colleagues, more than from my teachers, and from my students, most of all. And this is certainly true in this case. What Shani was trying to understand is how one can explain the appreciation of a scientific novelty, of a breakthrough that cannot be subsumed under a current scientific paradigm. How is a paradigm shift possible? She applied Kant's ideas on aesthetic judgment in art to explain how scientific novelty can initiate a shift to a new theoretical framework. She argued that before a new theory that can explain the new discoveries is developed, aesthetic judgment is applied to the new discovery. The scientist becomes aware of the apparent and as yet unexplained order displayed by the discovery, its purposiveness without purpose, by means of his, her, his or her pleasure in this unexplained order, recognized order. It sees the order, but it doesn't understand it. The discovery of these patterns induces exploration based on humans' reflective capacities and their desire for meaning through the free play of imagination, which is itself pleasurable. The desire for meaning and the joy of seeking lead eventually to a new concept, a new framework. The unexplained purposiveness of the new discovery is recognizable by the scientist and his community because of their shared communal sense. 
uh, shared reflective tools, shared curiosity, shared intellectual, culturally constructed zeitgeist in which the free play of imagination occurs. And one of the important things about human is our desire to make sense through the free play of imagination. And Kurt Vonnegut put it very, very well. Tiger got to hunt, bird got to fly, men got to sit and wonder, why, why, why? That's us. Now, what is the zeitgeist, if we're thinking about humans, what is the spirit of the time that anchors both our artistic and scientific views of the world in our century, in the 20th and 21st century? In a very important book, but not much read book, published in 1969, Behind Appearances, a study of the relations between painting and the natural sciences in this century, the biologist Conrad uh, Waddington point out, pointed out some of these outlooks which are shared by both scientists and artists. For example, he pointed out that there is no straight, strict dichotomy between the subjective and objective realities. Although the observer does not wholly fashion what she observes, her intrinsic biological human nature and her individual color, character color it. He also emphasized the recognition and celebration of variability of connectedness and embeddedness at different scales. Things have very fuzzy edges and are not wholly determinate. Things are actually events or processes whose stability and change cannot be adequately understood using a single spatial and temporal scale. And in the picture we see an Anna's depiction of vision. Vision is the result of an interaction of sensory biases, how the eye is built, for example, the brain, how the brain is built, the physical properties of the world, the wavelength, the kind of culture in which we live, our own idiosyncratic taste, but also our shared kind of sensibilities. The fact that we can extend through technology, through culture, uh, our, the range of the things that we see through telescopes, through microscopes, the fact that different, the, our appreciation that different animals see the world in, in different ways. All this is some, it, together form our understanding of what vision is. So we, this, we tried to capture and use aesthetic judgment in order to understand our own science, our own scientific research. And in our recent book, Picturing the Mind Through the Lens of Evolution, we tried to show the interpenetration of art and science. Simona and I used Anna's art to, ex to explore our own ideas, to open up new possibilities of understanding that go beyond our own inferences, our own framework. Her art made us engage in seeking new concepts and new meanings beyond the comfort zone of our own theory. So we started the book with uh, the exploration of different metaphors of the mind. And one of the metaphors uh, is uh, expressed by a very beautiful uh, poem by a 15th century po uh, Japanese poet, Ikkyu Sujon. What is the mind? It is the sound of the breeze that passes through the pines in the Indian ink picture. And what Anat did was to take this poem, and this poem is about a representation, the representation in words of an idea, that the imagined sound of the breeze in the imagined pines in the imagined Indian ink picture. So we have multiple levels of representation, which together are, capture something of the nature of the mind. What she did, she added another level of representation here by using the words of this poem in Hebrew and in English to draw a calligram of a pine tree in the wind. And in addition to giving this additional level of representation, she also physically, visually presented us with the direct experience of this, of the verbal image depicted in the, uh, depicted in the poem. Here is another example. In one, of our, in one section, we discussed uh, the rec a recurring theme in systems of philosophy and theology, the idea that two principles, either antagonistic or complementary, shape the human mind, good and evil, God and Satan, emotion and reason, female and male, yin and yang, eros and tantalus. And when Anat took this idea, 
she drew this picture on the right, which goes beyond these dichotomies. Yes, there are distinctions that we can make, but there are, such, but there are many, many aspects to every, to, to, to every category. They, we cannot make such dichotomous categories. There are many uh, categories and they are entangled. And, I, and we ended the book with a, by discussing a, a Stanislav Lem's book, Solaris, which, dis, which describes the limits of human understanding. It describes an ocean, a gelatinous kind of ocean, which is both living and conscious, that the humans studying it recognize as being alive and conscious, but totally cannot understand. What can they say, what they can say, for example, is that it is a symphony in geometry but we lack the ears to hear it. So they recognize the order, they and it inspires them. There is also great beauty in it, but that's the limits of their judgment of it. And the pictures shows us Anat's depictions of this, of this complexity, of this aesthetic, aesthetic only judgment. And I want to finish with uh, uh, Rita Levi Montalcini again. I want to come back to her because I think in this picture we also see the complex web of interactions between this woman's creativity, personality, commitment, and love of art and science. Thank you very much. So a few minutes. So let's resume the session again while someone is still streaming in. Great pleasure to welcome uh, um, Beatrice de Gelder. Be uh, she is professor in the Department of Cognitive Neuroscience at Maastricht University. And one of the themes of her research investigates the ways uh, how and why the representation of human bodies uh, and faces affect uh, the viewer. And today she will talk about beauty and the brain, a view from the body which reminds us that uh, there is no brain without a body. And I think this is something that we, it is probably a, a trivial thing to say, but often there is a, 
uh, to send a zooming in view. And she will address the question of the contribution from brain studies on a better understanding of the perception of the human body and its role in the arts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all being here. And let me add my most sincere thanks to the thanks expressed by the previous speakers already. Just add on a personal note my immense pleasure of being uh, in Rome and uh, specifically of being an event related to the Italian uh, Society for Neuroscience, of which I have been a very long time admirer. Good. Let's go. Right. Um, what is striking about this? What is striking about this picture? Well, if you at a quick glance you see that the uh, painter is painting flowers while she is surrounded by pictures, by paintings, all that have bodies in them. Okay. So we can deep we can have deep thoughts about what the alleg allegory allegory of painting is in this. But this is just an introduction to my team that actually bodies are everywhere since the earliest representations. Of uh, pictorial representations, uh, we have seen we have seen images of bodies in, of any possible. <laughs> this is a very this is not such a recent one. What I want to point out with that is the human brain is tuned to see bodies even with very complete or very distorted information, like here. Ah, okay. Um, various, uh, various uh, distorted, of course, examples of distorted informations. I should have named, added the name of the painters, but uh, certainly some of you will recognize them. Uh, most, uh, most recently, in most recent times, we have been exposed not just to normal bodies, to natural bodies, biological bodies, but we have been exposed to, we, we have uh, interactions with avatars, we have inter interactions, of course, with sculptures of bodies, and we have interactions with robots. So bodies already were everywhere, and now, uh, now we even have more, more and different representations of bodies. So having said that, what is... Uh, what is uh, the relation between art and the brain, specifically in the case of uh, in the case of the body? The goal the goal of um, the goal of studies of studies of art and uh, brain based studies, brain body based studies in, in general, is to understand the brain mechanisms that are engaged during during aesthetic during aesthetic uh, experience, aesthetic and uh, and related experience in the widest sense. Sense. Sometimes, since people, for example, started using the, the, the label neuro, neuroesthetics, this has been seen as reductionist, as taking away the mystery of art. As you saw, saw in some of the preceding talks, you can talk in a scientific way about artistic expressions without taking the mystery of, the, the, the mystery of art. This, but there have been criticisms of this endeavor uh, uh, in related to that. Um, in fact, and interestingly, some of the most ardent supporters of studies, uh, brain-based studies of arts, are found among the artists themselves, which is a nice encouragement for, uh, for that. So art, theories about art have had a long and complicated relation with issues about emotions. There are two, traditionally, two very extreme views. They're really extreme in the sense that one view says that art is about conveying emotions. And of course, specifically, that works out nicely for music. That, and sometimes uh, uh, artists that are not in the, in, in the domain of music envy uh, uh, musicians because they, have, they seem to have this more direct, direct access to expressions of emotions in music. There is, of course, another view, namely what I sort of paraphrase a little bit of caricature, a little bit that basically art is about art. Art is not about subjective emotions of anything. Art is sui generis, is really about art and not about experiencing emotions. Sorry. We've had in the last uh, 10 or 10 years uh, a bunch of different disciplines, actually, that originate uh, in the concern of relating art and science. There is, of course, visual neuroscience. There is neuroesthetics, I mentioned. We, ha we now have people working in computational aesthetics. We have people working in computational neuroesthetics. So bringing, bringing art and the brain together has, of course, led to, to uh, an explosion of those disciplines. 
in one of the in one of the previous talks, we had already some mentioning some mentioning about uh, different ways of approaching the relation between art and science. One is, and this is getting getting to the core of my topic. Some people some people have thought that the aesthetic experience, the 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 locus of the relation between art and the brain, is in an area in the brain that is sensitive to beauty. And that has been related to certain properties of the object, as we saw, for example, in, in attractiveness. So is art one, one line of uh, work in this area is art is uh, <coughs> what we need, to, we need to be concerned about in, in studies of on art and science is finding the properties of the object that trigger the aesthetic experience. Okay? Another approach is to relate, of course, those properties to the reward function they have as we also heard in one, of the, in one of the previous talks. That has led some people to propose some kind of hybrid or combined model of art and, art and uh, the brain. Namely, we have the sensory motor component, we have the emotion valuation reward, and we have the meaning knowledge. And these three come together in defining, in defining the, uh, power, uh, the power field of uh, uh, brain-based uh, studies of, of art. So, Slightly to phrase this differently or to recapitulate, there is line, there's two lines of thinking on this, namely, one is like the primacy of the object. Okay? The artistic experience is triggered by properties of the object. The other line of thought is the artistic experience is triggered in the observer. For example, there is a an area in the brain that is specifically devoted, devoted to either reward or beauty along those lines of properties. And we, of course, have had, uh, have had various proposals for that. My personal view, and one I would like to articulate in very few words and in a very unsatisfactory way, given, given my limited understanding of these matters and the, time, the limited time available, both together, is that um, we have to go beyond this dualism of saying it art is a property of the object or art is an emotion in the subject. We have to uh, <coughs> we have to find some kind of we have to sort of dig deeper underneath this uh, object subject dualism, and my way of doing that, my proposal to do it is that uh, we have to take the case of body perception as a special case that will lead us into into a better understanding towards a better understanding of artistic experience. You have noticed that the core concept for me is really artistic experience. Okay. I'm not talking about art as an object, not uh, talking about art as a subjective uh, emotion, but about artistic experience. And artistic experience is, in my view, and that's the view I will defend in, the, in, in a little time here, is rooted in the body. Okay. Now, to understand that, because that's still a very general statement, but to understand that, I will take a small detour to the kind of work we do in my lab, namely, study how people perceive bodies. And it's not so much about the detail of the brain, of the brain studies that about, than about what they will reveal us about the special status of the body, which I will argue is the lead into understanding artistic experience. This is just one study very recently uh, where, uh, in collaboration with people who, who do monkey imaging, we compare the specificity of uh, perceiving human bodies versus monkey bodies versus uh, human bodies versus uh, objects and faces. Okay? These are actually videos, but I'm not I'm showing them as, showing them as, uh, as uh, still pictures. Okay? We do find that uh, certain areas, it's not about the areas, don't worry about the areas, but the, the notion is specific areas of the brain are selective for human bodies, for moving human bodies as opposed to monkey bodies to objects, etc. Now, by itself, that's not a very startling claim because uh, many people outside neuroscience are now used to this. No ah, I do see them here. Uh, many people outside neuroscience are now used to this notion that there is areas in the brain doing something. But that's not the point of my claim. The point of my the point of my, what I want to show here is it, it, the kinds of areas that do this. It, the, kind, the kinds of the kinds of areas that do this are that are these are they are the ones that are really important. And you see here that the kinds of, it's not just one brain area doing bodies. By extension, I do, I do disagree with people, and, and there is a tendency, there is a literature out there saying that when you see a body, your brain, the body area in your brain lights up, and when you see a beautiful body, the body area in your brain lights up more. 
Okay? So I mean, that's, that's, a view, that's a view in the literature. That's not a view, that's not a view uh, that is supported by our studies on body perception because, first of all, you see, you see that uh, it's not just one area, it's a whole network of areas. And interestingly, <laughs> that network is specific for human bodies for perception of, the, of dynamic human bodies here. And it, it, has, uh, it, has the, it has the areas that have already shown up in previous talks. It has, for example, uh, <coughs> it has, um, it has uh, subcortical areas. It has the amygdala. That's an incomplete picture. But again, it's not about the brain pictures. It's really about the notion that there is a network. The network of perceiving bodies is not just a network where, you, where the body as an object of perception is seen. Another example from the same thing, we found in our studies that the brain is very sensitive to certain specific properties of the human bodies. Here, for example, we did, we did an analysis on videos. We can, analyze, we can analyze properties of the bodies. We can do the related computational analysis of body videos to brain to brain's, uh, <laughs> areas, and we see that specific, for example, here, here you see that the feature limb contraction which is a specific feature of the body, limb contraction is coded in the brain in areas related, for example, known from the literature as uh, fear, quote, unquote, areas. <laughs> so not only, not only does the brain specifically code for the human bodies in areas that are unrelated to the simple object, body as object of perception, but these areas can be detailed. We can look into more detail in them and see what, what expressions they convey and by which, means in the, by which means they convey them. Here, properties of the coordinated properties of the movement of the body. <laughs> another little, another little uh, piece of evidence. In a very recent study, we showed, that, uh, we showed that the brain is sensitive to the orientation of the body's left or right turned, and that this, this, that the areas coding for that are corresponding, corresponding to the way the own body is, tu is turned around. So you really use your own, what I want to argue, of course, you use your own body to, to perceive bodies. Now, <coughs> on to a study we did a couple of years ago, um, and which I, where we actually used uh, used uh, bodies in painting and uh, wanted to know what, uh, wanted to know the, the very simple, very simple feelings. I'm not talking about emotion, I'm talking about feelings of pain and pleasure, how we could like have, have a closer look, a closer look on those in, uh, in the brain. So we took a selection of San Sebastian paintings and we took a selection of, uh, you see, that is sort of funny. They have those arrows, and we took we made a version of the paintings where, the, as they are painted, and we made a version where the arrows are taken out, so to, to create these two conditions of pain and pleasure. Okay. That's the arrows taken out. Then we went we went to our female body paintings, and we took the arrows we had taken out of the San Sebastians, and we put them in the female body, and uh, which was actually for the for the people in the lab who, this is quite delicate work because we had also to move all the little drops of blood on the body. They also had to be moved to the... So we created, we created a female bodies with, uh, with arrows and that, that, that's too fast. That allowed us to have two similar conditions. We did, we showed those, uh, those images in, the, in the, a three Tesla scanner, but we did not give any instructions uh, because in the, the, the very, uh, very few studies we did that directly deal with, uh, with, uh, with paintings, we never ask people, uh, do you like it or don't you like it? Uh, is it beautiful or is it not beautiful? For we have our reasons for that and we can expand on that later. But it's important to notice that we did not, did not focus any instructions uh, on... Uh, <laughs> we had an oddball task, which is some jargon for, for how people put together their fMRI studies. So, and this is just one. This is just one study, underscoring underscoring the point and trying to make with this little this little uh, glimpses of brain studies. Namely, we have evidence across a bunch of different studies that the observer, the observer uses his own body to perceive to perceive uh, bodies in daily life, in painting, etc. 
Okay? So these are experiential structures of the brain. They are not object representations of the brain. Therefore, uh, hence my argument that artistic experience, beauty may be, that's a different story. I don't think art is about beauty, but that, that's a terrible thing to say, I know. Uh, but uh, but ar artistic experience is not about the object of experience, but is about the experience triggered by that. Okay? It's about the representation in the brain of the, of, of the brain-body interactions uh, <laughs> generated by, uh, by this. Uh, for example, uh, one structure that is absolutely central in this, uh, in this, um, in this constellation uh, of brain-body interaction is the insula. As you see here, that's a picture of the insula, a recent picture of the connectivity of the insula. And you see that the insula, which is a fairly, fairly, uh, um, well, it's not a modest structure. It's a fairly big structure in the brain, but it has it has a fantastic connectivity with all sorts of cortical and subcortical brain areas, all of which have been have been named in the in the previous papers, actually. Okay. So also the insula is very important because it it uh, it's uh, cons it's the it's the threshold for awareness of what you of what you feel. Okay. In this framework I'm developing, and this may have been misleading. I should point that out explicitly now. Emotions, in a biological perspective, emotions are really action structures, that action programs that are laid down in the, in the brain by true evolution. By contrast, feelings are the kind of awareness, the minimal awareness that can go to bigger, to, to more important awareness, but <laughs> awareness of the in, and that arises at the interface of bodily processes and neural processes. We've heard in the first talk, for example, very nice illustrations on how, on how memories change the neurobiology of the organism. Okay. So it's that this kind of, this kind of brain-body interaction is absolutely central in what I, in, as I would like to argue, for aesthetic experience. It's before, it's an experience before we talk about the properties of, of the object, okay? So, Now, and that's actually already my final slide. Now, what I want to, what, what the, the deep and sort of, sort of strange thought in, through the, the guiding line through my putting, my putting together the different aspects of our studies in this presentation is that body perception can function as actually, a mo I wouldn't say a model organism, but a model for understanding art experience. Because in body perception, we find structures of the brain that are not involved in the standard classical view on object perception. There are all those other structures. For example, I should have pointed out in the study of the pain and pleasure in the brain, we find, obviously, we find insula. We find anterior cingulate. Also, very interestingly, we find somatosensory cortex. When you watch, when you watch a painting like the ones I saw here, uh, you have activity in somatosensory cortex. Now, somatosensory cortex, cortex activity is typically associated with being touched by somebody else. So when you, when you watch, when you, when, you see, when you see your body, you have, the, you, you have brain activity in somatosensory cortex as if you were touched. On the other hand, being touched is actually the interface between your body and the world. So that's why those are some of the arguments I would like to develop for uh, arguing that, uh, that uh, body perception is unique among all other kinds of perceptions we have. Maybe hearing your own voice does something similar, but I'm not sure. But body perception combines this inside and outside, these inside and outside processes, interoception and exteroception, and could figure as the kind of core the kind of core or the kind of model to understand uh, artistic experience. Okay. This does not invalidate any kind of any kind of more objective uh, based approach to art to artworks too. But it is a core element that indeed in the literature has uh, been pretty much ignored in uh, in uh, past uh, past work. Now, why uh, do I call that? Why do I sort of metaphorically uh, metaphorically? Uh, would like to present that as 
in art experience, you grow, you, you sort of grow a meta body because in art experience, you, it's also a little bit like driving a car. When you drive a car, the body becomes the extension of your, of your, the car becomes the extension of your own body. You feel the closeness of objects that actually don't touch your body, they touch your car. So what I would like to argue is that in art experience, something very similar happens. Now, the easiest, uh, easiest to make the case is, of course, architecture. Okay? When, you are, when you look at a building, you feel inside the building, you feel the building around you as an extension of your body. People are, of course, not, not too often aware of that, but um, there is an increasing, uh, increasing interest among architects also. We have actually one little grant where we have a collaboration with Zaha Hadid in the uh, office in London, uh, where we look into those things. But I hope I can sort of convey the bodiness of those, uh, the bodiness of those buildings, of course, with the, with the, with the uh, Pompidou one, it's very clear. You can see it's almost a cabling. It's almost a cabling of the visual system you can see in there. Uh, it's very clear also with the Louis Vuitton Foundation, and it's equally very clear with a different architect in whose work we are, we are actually, actually uh, here right now. So my sort of, this kind of, it's not just an extension of your own body, like in like the car is felt as an extension of your own body, but it's like an enrichment, a meta body, and uh, through through that kind of concept, which should be developed, uh, I hope on next on the next occasion maybe, uh, I want to also integrate integrate or interactions with uh, with video art or interactions with avatars and those different things because there also we have to we have to explain how an avatar can can be how you can be present in an avatar, what, keep, what people call embodiment. And in the, same, in the same way, art experience makes you extend your presence, makes you presence, present in this, in this kind of, kind of uh, environment, imaginary environment as, as it has been devised, as your artistic experience has actually been designed by the artist because no artwork exists without the artistic experience of the person participating in it. And I want to stress the kind of bodily experience that this is, uh, that this, uh, that how we may look upon this as some kind of bodily experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor De Gelder, for a very inspiring talk and uh, First question there. Uh, see, arriva. Thank you, Bea, for underlining and highlight this crucial point of artistic uh, perception and, uh, and desire, let's say. I want to underline a point that you just mentioned in your experiment, that there are gender differences, perhaps in the appreciation, and in particular, in the level of empathy that gender can uh, produce and the brain process uh, artistic materials. Do you have, in your slides, it was evident that females highlight more and more these limbic structures when looking at an artistic uh, picture with some strong empathic component, such as wands and so on. Do you have other evidence that females are more empathic in this body involvement, also for artistic perception? That's a very, very complicated and a very, very tricky question, of course, uh, that has many, many explanations, some of them may be sociological. Uh, um, it may be that women have uh, that women are closer to bodily experience, have had different occasions on which to be closer to their body. That is, those are all factors. That is all factors. Um, there is also the issue that gender is a complicated word, also, uh, and uh, may play differently in different uh, in different areas of human experience. So this is certainly certainly something to be something to be to be investigated. A limit of uh, uh, brain imaging studies is uh, that uh, you need uh, you need big cohorts like in this you need like at the very least you need to have 25 male 25 me uh, female or you need to that's that's a practical limit also you need to have better assessment of a better assessment of uh, what gender people identify with more and on what occasion 
I mean, these are all very big open empirical issues that luckily we are on the way to, to at least putting on the table now. So, if there are no other questions, I thank you again very much indeed. And now in our interdisciplinary journey that we are making, it is a real pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, uh, Lina Bolsoni. We are going now into humanities. And Professor Lina, uh, Lina Bolsoni is professor of Italian literature at Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa and a member of the Accademia Nazionale di Lincei. Uh, professor Bolsoni has, uh, amongst her many interests over the years, she has uh, investigated the mnemonics the art which originates in the classic world, how techniques to remember, and in the medieval and Renaissance Europe. And she has published uh, many uh, uh, seminal books. Uh, some of them, uh, many of them are translated in many languages. I will quote the titles in Italian. La Stanza della Memoria, La Rete delle Immagini, uh, Il Lettore Creativo, Il Cuore di Cristallo. These are titles that are really uh, uh, evocative of uh, the many interactions between uh, um, images, uh, memory, and art, and literature. So thank you, and today she, uh, um, Professor Bolsoni will talk about uh, emotions uh, in the art of mnemonics. Thank you. Buongiorno. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have to say that I'm really honored and happy and glad to uh, attend this extraordinary initiative. And I thank all of the organizers for uh, giving me the chance to uh, take the floor. I wish to say that there are a lot of things that can be said when it comes to memory, things that we forgot. Grazie. Wonderful, thank you. So, um, as uh, Paolo Rossi has said, we forgot a lot when it comes to the memory. Forgot, for instance, we forgot that uh, in the past it's played a role that for us it's even difficult to conceive. And in fact, there was a true art of memory. So actually, we had uh, techniques and theoretical assumptions that tried to broaden and increase the natural uh, ability to remember. So this is very interesting uh, for us today as well, because this experience um, means uh, experiencing the power of images and the mastery and the control of emotions. So let's see which were the main components of this tradition. And let's start with the origins. That is to say, when you when we didn't know the writing and in a verbal society, memory plays a fundamental role to uh, ensure survival and the identity of the human the community. So in the Greek myths, memory is a goddess, Mnemosyne, and the mother of muses. And uh, therefore, it's important to think about this charming link between memory and poetry. And the poet has the task of spreading the, the essential knowledge and also the task of uh, allowing the past to be remembered so that it's possible to pass on values. And therefore, we have the... Um, the possibility to have in our mind both the uh, uh, the person that is telling it and the audience that is listening to the story. So it's linked to the oral uh, society. The problem of memory is uh, strong also in the age of writing, where a precise institutional uh, it was fun, Aristo and uh, Cicero, Quintilian. So memory becomes part and parcel of rhetorics and teaches to speak in public and also to remember a speech in order to be persuasive also needs to be uh, memorable. And also from here, the art of memory um, passes from the uh, 
classic uh, speakers to the arts pretty candy of Middle Ages. But in fact, there was the art of memory, and it has been developed uh, on the basis of the most ancient witnesses that tell us that the techniques are the, of the memory are like those of the writing, because they teach to have uh, to engrave memories in our mind by connecting them to images in, in the same way as for instance uh, a uh, um, scribe or a copist engraves so writing contributes to creating a, a space idea of our mind and of the memory in the sense that the mind and the memory appears like a space divided into places and that is where uh, sensitive images are located that can, be, that can be either be kept or disappear. St. Augustine talks about caves and palaces and the spaces of the mind and of the memory, whereas other uh, images define it as, for instance, uh, uh, the closet or like Petrarch talks about, for instance, uh, a uh, uh, specific a box where the fruits of the meditation and the reading are kept, but it's possible to open a hole in this casket, in this box, and also the precious contents may fly away. So Dante in Vita Nova described his memory as a book, uh, the book of memory containing and also uh, and represented and described the uh, stories of his love to Beatrice, but they share the perception of memory being something that lives in space, in the in a building or in the space of the book. So now the uh, uh, analysis of the natural working of the memory showed that there are some conditions that make memories easy. That is to say, uh, order and the game of matching and associations. So the fact of having a set, a tidy set of places and having images there, that is to say, images that can uh, uh, strike our attention and uh, they, are, uh, they allow us to remember things and words, they will be pivotal for the uh, tradition of memory. And it's very interesting also for our um, uh, conference today, uh, the uh, reference to the quality of uh, images, that is said, uh, the images to which we uh, give. A specific space for our memory, so they have to. They don't have to be trivial. Actually, they have to help us to adopt a different point of view when it comes to memories. So they share something uh, like the uh, uh, strangeness that the Russian formalist um, in, included in a specific area of the literature. So the images of the memory shall not just take a picture, a snapshot of memories. Rather, they have to transform memories through. Uh, for instance, uh, matching, and in fact, images agentes also means uh, images that uh, play a role, as it happens in the theater of our mm, memory, and which are masked in order to act. The techniques of the memory have uh, uh, a long duration with a number of components that uh, remain steady, and uh, they also change through and over the centuries. They change the uh, uh, meaning and the function of those meanings. For instance, the Christian word inherits, uh, for instance, the classical word and transforms it. So the techniques of the memory are a strong uh, ethical uh, aspect and are intertwined with meditation and also play a role in the purification from the guilt and then uh, uh, aspiring to God. So the creative role in, of the memory is is important as well. It's not just a matter of uh, recalling words and images that were produced already, but rather to have producing words and images that uh, uh, may become memorable and which are engraved in our minds. And in this perspective as well, if we think about, for instance, Dante's uh, uh, com com the Divina Commedia, we have some extraordinary aspects. In fact, as Francis had said, we may consider uh, Divina Commedia as a system of memory of vices and, uh, vices and virtues and also a pathway that Dante um, describes through the three kingdoms. Uh, and in fact, let's consider the poem from the point of view of the main components that we mentioned, that is to say, the order and the uh, imaginary agentes. The order includes the pathway that Dante made from the 
her hell and then uh, up to reaching the heavens. And it's a precise order set by God. It's an order that in uh, uh, hell uh, is forever and uh, then uh, becomes uh, something that is linked to time. And this is in particular to purgatory, whereas in uh, heaven it's just a rhetorical instrument through which God uh, communicates to the human mind. In fact, Beatrice says that all of the souls are not located in the heavens in which Dante meets them. Rather, uh, they appear in this way. And in fact, this is the way in which, and this is a quote of uh, Dante's uh, Divina Commedia, that is to say, uh, this is something you need to remember. So, uh, in the uh, Divina Commedia, we find this convergence of the pathway and the order of the different places and this aspect um, as immediately intrigued those that, for instance, described uh, the uh, Commedia. Because, for instance, showing the pathway Dante covered is fundamental to get oriented in the map of the poem. And in fact, this is an extraordinary example uh, by uh, Botticelli that depicts the uh, uh, hell. Unfortunately, he we don't see all of the details, but all of the details are filled with the images of uh, Uh, the uh, uh, people that were in the hair that they gradually meet, or these other example of how Botticelli described uh, the uh, heavenly spheres. Then, from the point of view of the order and the pathway, well, of course, the Divina Commedia uh, appears to us as a system of memory, also because in the different places, Dante meets uh, characters that are truly memorable. So not just because, as our book showed, their individuality uh, also takes on a universal value, but also because each one of these characters uh, becomes an image of memory of uh, the uh, specific virtue that is rewarded uh, or also uh, of the vice which is condemned. So in this case, there's uh, the, uh, the matching between uh, the guilt and uh, the penalty. So the explicit statement of this principle is expressed by Bertrand de Bond. So we uh, observe Uh, the uh, specific uh, retaliation. Uh, that is to say, this is one of the most unbelievable images and shocking portions of the uh, Inferno because this is uh, uh, Bertrand de Bone. That is to say, he holds one's uh, head. Uh, and uh, in this case, there it is because it pushed the prince to uh, go against his father. And his image makes it clear the essence of the guilt that affects him because he uh, actually destroyed the body of the state and separated the head from the body. So in this case, um, this shows the similarity and uh, considers the metaphor. So this is the description by Doré, which represents the same and depicts the same episode. So actually, the metaphor is literally considered, so the similarity becomes visible. And in this case, uh, these become images of uh, memory, images sedentes, both of the guilt and of the Uh, heavenly justice, but there are emotions uh, that trigger everything. That is to say, it's them that uh, also convey the reaction before the nature of the penalty. And in fact, Dante's memory is passion that involves the pilgrims, but also the poet that uh, writes down what he saw. It is a memory that lasts while writing and which intends to uh, convey the message to us. So the passionate memory is intertwined uh, with the idea of the retaliation and then with the basic technique that is used to develop the images of the memory. Think about, for instance, for instance, the deepest part of the hell where the uh, those that betray their uh, relatives and parents are in the ice lake. And here we have Fusley's uh, image. And uh, in particular, here Dante says, and quote uh, that these 
people actually were in icy in the icy lake and had no chance to go away from it. So I saw the thousands of faces that were destroyed uh, by the uh, cold. And each time I see, for instance, icy waters, I immediately uh, feel uh, cold, and I'll always be cold. So we have a contrast between the past tense, so the story, which is the pilgrim's travel and journey, and the present times, the moment in which the writing is done. So this relationship between the past and the present, between the memory and the writing, is always characterized by a strong emotional component. In fact, the beginning of the Divina Commedia, I found myself in an obscure maze. Oh, it's very difficult to tell how it was this wild and strong uh, that in that renews its fears. So how was it in the past? How was the world in the past? And then when you write it, then you renew the fear you had when you first uh, lived it. And as we saw uh, in the verses I mentioned before, when it, uh, there's not just this uh, idea between the past and the present, but also everything is projected towards the future. And in fact, um, there's a specific experience of the earthly, let us say the, the fact of seeing the icy lake recalls in the mind by analogy the scene in hell. Those that changed the rules of love, they were not um, sensitive to uh, uh, love are now uh, plunged in the lake and in ice. And then so this is the nature of guilt. So the memory um, and the terrible images in Dante's minds and uh, uh, are strengthened and even reinforced in the future. In other words, the moral horror is also extended in the physical horror and in the feeling of uh, cold and ice that the, um, the experience generates. So the border between the body and psyche are somehow outpassed. The strength of the imagination uh, is able to do so and we as readers, we are invited to share with Dante the entire uh, process with uh, the uh, knowledge and rejection, the both the moral and the physical rejection. With Dante, the medieval memory uh, performs all the tasks it had to carry out and conveys the memory of vices and virtues and the order of the world and also the interior evolution and transformation up to stating the limits of the heaven. So uh, it's the traces left by emotions that will represent an evidence of the truth of the experience lived. And uh, in fact, quote, the sweet that in that stamped out of it. So the uniform, uh, the universal um, image uh, that is conveyed uh, shows that, well, now we cannot uh, show any longer what is not visible any longer, but what remains is the emotion and the sweetness of that moment and also uh, the reward stemming from that experience. I'd like to conclude with, with some examples taken from the Renaissance, because in the Renaissance period, the art of the memory is linked to the uh, uh, encyclopedic dreams uh, like Giulio Camillo, but at the same time, it continues to be used for practical purposes in schools and universities and uh, in uh, preaching and there's also a specific component that is to say the strength of the errors the power of the images that evoke it and there is also a specific treaty the uh, by Pietro della Venna uh, that was written at the end of the um, 15th centuries, and which uh, offers a variant of one of the typical ingredients of the tradition of the memory, that is to say, uh, the uh, uh, the alphabet. You see it here uh, from uh, Giovan Battista dalla Porta, from in Ars Memoria. And in fact, it says, well, generally speaking, instead of uh, using letters, I have uh, images of the ladies I loved. And, of course, this works very well. Of course, those that are sensitive to this particular experience, well, this is uh, absolutely important. So the fact of using as images of the memory the images of the people that you loved in your lives. And 
Uh, since, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, these uh, works uh, were written by men, while well, we have images of women. And it's very interesting because when dealing with the reactions that the uh, Protestants made against the use of images, the Catholic Church uh, made an interesting uh, analysis on the limits and the power of images. For instance, in 1582, uh, Cardinal Gabriele Paleotti quoted as an example of the power images uh, uh, the arts of memory and said that images, uh, live images, are also and almost violating our senses. So images are so strong that uh, they uh, violate our senses where no precautions are adopted. So it's interesting, interesting to see how in uh, the um, um, in the fact of using as imaginary agentes the images of uh, young ladies, but at the same time, this may cause problems. For instance, uh, at the beginning of the 17th century, there was the use of uh, a naked lady to represent the soul in a treaty by Girolamo Parafiotto, um, a Franciscan monk from the Calabria region. So it is as if the use of a naked image to depict the soul on the one side works as an image of the memory, but on the other side, uh, it takes it apart and removes its immediate power. And uh, so uh, from this point of view, it's very interesting to see what happens immediately after. For instance, in uh, the Arte di Predicare Bene, the Bishop of Tortona, he says, yeah, this type of um, images may work very well, but the problem is that you risk to to stop there just um, before the erotic image and not to use it as an image of your memory. So you remain stuck there as it happens. Uh, when, for instance, something at, uh, at the middle of the sea just blocks and the, the vessel. So this is a way of focusing around the objects that we desire and turn them into something that uh, fills our vital spaces. Then at the end of the 16th century, the link between art of the memory, emotions, and uh, literary, uh, literary creation is clearly um, adopted by Giordano Bruno that was uh, burned in, uh, the, in Rome. And uh, for him, passions are the main uh, constraint. And in fact, he wrote that passions and the possibility to act along passions is such an important secret uh, in rhetorical treaties, but also in, uh, uh, but also, uh, for instance, uh, a specific test in which the uh, issue of uh, passions is linked uh, to the memory. Uh, that is to say, the church's uh, song, where Chicha explains that it's a lie what is generally said that she transforms men into animals because she only a uh, takes out and makes it visible what is hidden in the soul of uh, a man. So if in the soul of men we have uh, a busy uh, instincts, she makes them visible. And in this way, um, she um, takes out the nature of man. She removes the mask of man and she makes it visible, what is generally hidden. And the art of memory allows to remember the combinations between animals and passions. Here we see some of the images that we find in uh, uh, this text. So uh, in this case, um, Cantus uh, Chirchos uh, uh, here takes on uh, the uh, role of uh, reporting, uh, for instance, uh, the mystifications that are present in the society. So with this dream of truth and transparency, uh, this is how I like to close my contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lina. Your uh, contribution uh, gave me a, a, a strong emotion uh, because it is so 
beautiful to bring together such different disciplines uh, through uh, everyday language. P uh, please allow me to ask a question. <clears throat> As a neuroscientist, uh, I interpret something you said. Memory is something that lives in space and creates an ordered uh, set of places. You spoke about these uh, techniques. As a neuroscientist, I'd like to say that the brain is organized through maps. Mr. Tolman's the cognitive map. We know spatial, about spatial maps. We know about conceptual maps. So probably there's something very deep in what you said, which goes beyond a cultural analogy. This is just a comment of mine. I don't know, are there questions? May I say something about this? Yes, this is a fascinating topic which lies at the basis of a cooperation I have undertaken uh, between Scuola Normale and Alberto Maffei. This uh, uh, scientist teased us uh, because we are uh, experts in literature, but then he was fascinated by the issue you are addressing. How much of this intellectual analysis connected to historical text, uh, how much of all this is uh, an connected to physiology, to physiological structures? And uh, it is extremely interesting. We may talk about this. There are many uh, sort of uh, techniques which have to do with memorizing, uh, which consist in connecting images and that which must be remembered. I'd like to understand from you both how this works in the brain, it's starting from Pico della Mirandola famous for his memory, that memorizing uh, many objects is, is difficult, and those who can and do use techniques. Antonino, you were talking about uh, brain maps, indeed. I think that Anna Monnier, Hanna Monnier, will be speaking exactly about this. So I'd like to leave the floor to Hannah at this point. Let us wait and see. What Thank you very much once again. And with this, uh, we. Uh, uh, no, the music, scusate. Uh, Sorry, we have music first. So once again, Maestro Agnese Coco uh, for her third piece of music. Thank you. As the last uh, piece of the day, I'd like to uh, play La Source by Hasselmans. It is an image of water coming out, uh, seeping out of the source, can be likened to emotions uh, which are stimulated and uh, seep out of art.
ringraziamo di cuore veramente. We would like to thank Maestro Coco from the bottom of our hearts and it's a great pleasure to call Hannah Monnier. Anna is professor of neuroscience at Heidelberg University and director of the Department of Clinical Neurology at Heidelberg University. And I must say it is also with great uh, pride uh, that uh, she now has opened the lab uh, at our institute at Ebb in Roma, where she is directing a group uh, studying spatial memory. And this is a great uh, value for, for our institute. Uh, Anna is a neuroscientist who has made seminal contribution in uh, molecular and cellular mechanisms uh, underlying many important uh, phenomena in, uh, in, uh, in the function of the brain and uh, um, made seminal contributions. And today she will talk about uh, taking us about a bidirectional journey between memory and emotions, also touching into literature, as uh, we understand from her title, because art as a trigger of emotions in Marcel Proust's research. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, Antonio. I also don't want to miss the opportunity to thank the organizers, to spe thank especially Viviana, to thank you, Antonino, Enrico from Ebri, having proposed me certainly to give this talk here, and to everyone else who has made this, this, this event something very, very special, the beautiful music, music that you have heard. And of course, I'm very, very honored to speak on this occasion, also thinking of Rita Levi of Montalcini, who I actually once met um, in the Vatican, and was very impressed by her. I read her biography, the first one that she wrote, and I was very impressed by the passion with which she wrote about her work. Now, she was somebody who was not only a great scientist, she could cook very well, she was interested in music, she was interested in art, and we learn all that in, in her biography. So I will take you on a journey, and I must say that the speakers who were talking before, in, just, just today, Actually, all of them have some bearing on what I have to tell you now. So all the talks have been beautiful introductions to my work. So the scientific part, which I will present, has actually nothing to do with the work from my lab and you know, work from great people who I'm sure they follow the talk now in the lab. Um, but I actually try to unite some ideas forwarded by others and make a very brief summary, a little bit bearing on the first talk, and then I want to do together Together with you a text analysis on three or maybe four paragraphs from Marcel Proust in which you will find united all these components that you have heard about today. You will hear here how emotions are very influential on memory formation. You will hear how memory, on the opposite, they Inf how, how memory influences emotions and vice versa. You will hear the importance of the reward system and something that we did not touch so much upon today. You will hear the importance of cognition in generating pleasure, which I find very, very interesting. Um, and I want to go with you through these texts. So let me begin. Yeah, so we heard uh, about Memosine already from Lina on the last talk, and she pointed out already um, how important memory is and this direct connection between Memosine, the goddess of memory, and the muses. So memory and creativity. Now, we also heard from Lina just in this very last talk about the Ars Memoria and how going back to Greek tradition, memory is spatialized and how we can use the Ars Memoria to enhance our memories, how this technique has been used over centuries and how it changed and how we, and, and the fruition it brought also in art and Dante was the best example. So here you find also in my talk a few examples how difficult texts were memorized by putting them in a particular location that is known to you. This can be part of your body as here the hand, but also music can be memorized in this fashion. And here you have other examples. This is from an incunabel that is in Karlsruhe in Germany, where a very a lengthy prayer is also broken up in parts and put on the different members, on the different parts of your, of your digits. And of course, you would say the, this prayer 
for, uh, for, uh, for you know, to, to get benediction, to, to uh, uh, and, and again, this, this was a source to help you memorize these difficult talks. Now, there are also other ones, ladders are often used to spatialize something that you want to memorize. And again, we heard from Lena, which of course I did not know she would show that one of the most beautiful examples is Botticelli's Inferno that I hope that I will see on Saturday in this exhibition um, shown here in, in Rome. So to put things or to have them in a certain location helps you memorize, it helps you um, record your memories better. Now we move into the scientific part very, very quickly and and here too, we heard in the first talk this morning, you know, how our brain will change, how if you remember something of what you've heard today, tomorrow something has changed in your brain. And it can change at different levels. It changes physically, actually. And we know this ever, ever since your great Golgi produced, you know, or developed the technique of the Golgi silver impregnation technique. And we could visualize these individual neurons in the brain, these workers that help us generate memories, and this would be one neuron and its dendrite. So this is the structure where a neuron receives all the information, and in the magnification you see these little spines where most of the receptors are located. Now, if for instance you were to see the brain or uh, itself from an Alzheimer patient, all these spines are gone. So here you have many, many, many receptors which actually help the neurons to talk to each other. Now, you you see here in this particular slide two filled neurons, so said this is in the hippocampus, the structure that I will talk about later, and you see this one neuron and its cell body, and the output of the neuron is one axon. So if you look at the ramification of these axons, a neuron would make, in, on average, about 10,000, 20,000 synapses with other neurons, so you can imagine the complexity that we have when it is about communication of neurons in the brain. Now, in this animation, you will see what happens when neurons talk to each other, and it bears on what I have to say afterwards with the Proust, on, on the Proust text. If a, the, we, we have an enlarged synapse where a neurotransmitter is released, so this is the ending coming from a particular neuron far away, and when the neurotransmitter is being released, it opens in the next cell in the, at the synapse particular types of um, receptors, and you can measure an electrical signal. So I hope that this works. Okay, so when the neurotransmitter is being released, and, uh, the receptors are activated, and in the lab, we can measure the, the strength of the signal, we can measure the amplitude of this signal. Now what happens if a cell is repetitively stimulated? In that case, other receptors open up, and it is particular this NMDA receptor that I worked on when I was young. We cloned it in the lab of Peter Zeeberg. This receptor is normally silent, but upon repetitive stimulation, it opens up. And what happens now, if hours later, the cell is stimulated again, this synaptic current is larger. Now, I cannot talk about the different mechanisms, and we heard in the first talk how this larger current can be generated. You can have either more neurotransmitter being released. You, they can, the cell can modify the existing neurotransmitters, or what the cell can also do, it can put a new transmitter into the synapse so that the signal stays larger for a longer time. So we are interested in that, what we is called plasticity, and when we learn, this is what happens in our brain, and I am very particularly interested, um, as Christina this morning, in this structure that we now have heard about uh, quite a bit, the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus is important for learning and memory, and for that type of memory that Christina has introduced to us that we call episodic memory. That is a memory that has to deal with what happened, where, and when. And I will now show you, and we will see it also later, that the hippocampus is absolutely essential for generating this memory. And the hippocampus is very, very important for 
for giving this for for generating cognitive maps and for giving us this map in which we move basically in time and in space now but i want to point out already at this moment that when we speak about the memories the hippocampus is important to generate these memories but we heard already in all the other talks that other systems are involved we heard about the amygdala that is important for 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 the generation, the maintenance of emotions, for the recall of emotions, and the amygdala talks directly uh, with the hippocampus. We will actually hear later about the frontal cortex that is important for cognition. We heard about the striatum not shown here, it is deep in the brain, that is very, very important for the reward system. And all these systems get activated when we experience or when we recall strong um, uh, uh, memories. Now, in the lab, we can record from individual cells. There are different techniques. But I, what I want to show you is whenever you see such a blip in such a trace, like here, there is a spike that the cell is active. And today, with modern measures, you can see when I move from A to B, which cell is active, for instance. Of course, we do not do that in humans. We also work with animal models. But in our brain, it would not look different. And we are absolutely sure that what we learn from the animal animal models can be translated directly to the human. So we can see which cell is active in which context under which circumstances. Now, this is a slice that is very, very important to me and that brings me back to, this, to, this, to the last talk. The hippocampus is important to generate the spatial map because, as O'Keefe and the Mosers have shown, and they obtained the Nobel Prize for that, in the hippocampus and its adjacent structures, there are cells that are called place cells, or grid cells, or head direction cells, or border cells. So we have a GPS system in this structure. And as shown here, if the animal runs in this particular space, in gray, you see the trajectory. In red, you see action potentials, so these individual blips. You, the cell is active. And if the animal, in, on the next day, you put the animal back in the same space, the cell would be active there. So the same would happen when I move from A to B. I have cells that are active in my hippocampus. And that map, so I have place cells for this spot. I have place cells for this spot. I have place cells for the other spot. And this cognitive map tells me where I am. Now, the hippocampus, and that is most important, gets input from all the other sensory modalities, so from vision, from the motor system. And therefore, whatever we memorize in episodic memory, or most what we memorize, takes place in a particular space. If you remember where you have heard a certain Schubert song, it was in that and that opera hall or concert hall. It is because we associate with that music a particular space. So in the hippocampus, the event that happens is associated with the space where it happens because the hippocampal formation gives you this particular spatial map. So that is important and that's why putting particular memories in a space helps us memorize it better. But our own body actually encodes our events in space because we are in that space and it is associated. So what I see today, what I hear today is associated with this particular space. And that is, of course, very, very, very important. If you remove the hippocampus, uh, this space, this, this map is gone. And the last technical slide, let me tell you very, very briefly. So here you would have an example, for instance, what happens if an animal runs in this particular environment. You have a place cell here in red. You see these are these ticks here. Each one is an action potential. The animal moves. The next cell is the blue cell. The cell is, or the, yeah, the, the blue cell. Immediately afterwards, the pink cell is active, and then the green cell. Now, something very, very, very important and you will find that in the Proust set, we encode space not exactly the way it is. If there is something important in that space, we associate that object with the space, and afterwards, in our sleep, there happens something that is called replay. The activity of the cells that have been active during waking they are repeated several times at a higher velocity. And those cells that have been active together during the wake period, 
their synapses strengthen during sleep. So the sleep is also there to consolidate these memories. Now, what is also important is that during sleep, those events that happen in this environment that are not important for the animal, they are not repeated that often or are not repeated at all. So what I want to convey to you, our memories are not a facsimile of our experiences. Our memories are chunks that are memorized that are important for us. So all of us will experience different things today and we will remember different things. And again, there was nobody who illustrated that as perfectly, I find, 100 years ago, not knowing how memories function, as Marcel Proust, who actually describes from the very first, from how perceptions happen to short-term memory, long-term memory, and how these long-term memories are actually, all our memories are actually placed in space and in a particular context. So, um, I have now, uh, in, the, in the next part, I would like to go with you through these texts, but I have one more slide, and just for you in the text to recognize all the important parts that I have mentioned so far. So perception will be the first part, then short-term memory, long-term memory, and if I have time, I will also show you this context-dependent association. Now, the protagonist whom I'm going to talk to you about, Swan, has the whole piece of that he memorizes is a, is a short piece, a phrase of music. And we, in the first passage that I will read to you, you will see that it is just a very short phrase. He does not remember that whole sonata. He does not remember the whole andante. It is a particular preference that he has, maybe due to his education. He is not um, educated in, he is not educated in music. Swan is actually an art collector. He knows about paintings. So he is not really a musician or has this particular knowledge. Nevertheless, his taste makes it in some way that he likes this particular phrase. And you will see beautifully, he, he likes it because this phrase evokes very strong emotions. Now, another interesting point is, he, what I find very, very important is that this phrase evokes stimulating thoughts and thoughts that make Swan feel a different, they rejuvenate him. He, he feels young again, he feels creative again, and that is what the music does with him. And what I have shown you on this animation, how neurons talk to each other, you will see that this phrase comes back several times, and it's, it is this repetition that helps, so the repetitive stimulus that helps Swan to remember that. And finally, rethinking about this experience after he goes home, that is the process then where this rethinking helps the consolidation. So now let's go quickly through this text. And I have to read it slowly because, um, because Proust's sentences begin on one page and they end on the next page. So very, I highlighted those parts that I find particularly important. So on perception, just before we start, Proust does not expect this. He's at a soiree, he's invited. And he hears something that he has heard a year before. So this is the second time when Proust is exposed to this. So we read, the year before, at an evening party, he had heard a piece of music played on the piano and violin. At first, he had appreciated only the material quality of the sounds, which those instruments secreted, so something very material. And it had been a source of keen pleasure when, below the delicate line of the violin part, slender but robust, compact and commanding, he had suddenly become aware of the mass of the piano part beginning to emerge in a sort of liquid rippling of sound, multiform but indivisible, smooth yet restless, like the deep blue tumult of the sea, silvered and charmed into a minor key by the moonlight. But then, at a certain moment, without being able to distinguish any clear outline or to give a name to what was pleasing him, suddenly, enraptured, he had tried to grasp the phrase or harmony, he did not know which, that had just been played and that had opened and expanded his soul as the fragrance of certain roses 
wafted upon the moist air of evening, has the power of dilating one's nostrils. Perhaps it was owing to his ignorance of music that he had received so confused an impression, one of those that are nonetheless the only purely musical impressions, limited in their extent, entirely original, and irreducible to any other kind. An impression of this order, vanishing in an instant, is, so to speak, sine materia. So it is the pure impression, it is an acoustic stimulus, it is something unexpected, no associations, no uh, comparisons with somebody, something, something else. And, but we see already, so Swan has not much of an experience in this field, and it, he isn't raptured, it does something, and it is just this particular phrase that does it to him. And now we move on to the second part, which is very, very, very dense, because there we will see everything what this music then triggers in Swan and what it does to him. So this is short-term memory. Let, before we le read the text, it is very, very important because while he listens to this music, and that's why he also will not remember everything, because he has already thoughts, and he wonders, how come that my memory can memorize something, or how, how happens that I can hear a whole tune if the next impression comes, and the next impression comes, and the next impression comes. And there is beautiful work for Goldman Rakic, who worked, uh, who worked with monkeys, showing that when a monkey holds something in memory, there are these cells that if you give the monkey a visual stimulus, and the monkey has then to push a button, you have cells in the prefrontal cortex that are active during this time that the monkey keeps something in short-term memory. And Swan actually wonders, how happened, how come that if I begin a sentence, how come that when I come to the end of the sentence, you re I can have the whole phrase? It's because we have short-term memory that keep the beginning in mind till I have come to an end. That happens with music, that happens with language. So let's read the text together. But the notes themselves have vanished before these sensations have developed sufficiently to escape submersion under those which the succeeding or even simultaneous notes have already begun to awaken us. Did not our memory, like a laborer who toils at the laying down of firm foundations beneath the tumult of the waves, by fashioning for us a facsimile, of those fugitive phrases enable us to compare and to contrast them with those that follow. And so, scarcely had the exquisite sensation which Swan had experienced died away before his memory had furnished him with an immediate transcript, sketchy it is true and provisional, which he had been able to glance at while the piece continued, so that when the same impression suddenly returned, it was no longer impossible to grasp. He could picture, he could picture to himself its extent, its symmetrical arrangement, its notation, its expressive value. He had before him something that was no longer pure music, but rather design, architecture, thought, and which allowed the actual music to be recalled. This time he had distinguished quite clearly a phrase which emerged for a few moments above the waves of sound. It had at once suggested to him a world of inexpressible delights of whose existence before hearing it he had never dreamed, into which he felt that nothing else could initiate him. And he had been filled with love for it as with a new and strange desire. Then it vanished. He hoped with a passionate longing that he might find it again a third time. When he returned home, he felt the need of it. He was like a man into whose life a woman he has seen for a moment passing by has brought the image of a new beauty which deepens his own sensibility although he does not even know her name or whether he will ever see her again. So you have all the moments that we have heard of, 
You need this memory, the shorter memory, who keeps in shorter memory what has just passed. That helps him. Now, something very, very important, what proves himself, in the same text, he corrects himself. He said, if our brain or our memory does not make a facsimile, a facsimile is an exact transcript of what has happened. But then he corrects himself. Our brain does not make a facsimile, as I had shown you with the place cells. Our brain actually removes parts that we are not interested in and that we are not emotionally touched by. So he corrects himself and says, actually, what Swan made, what his brain made, is a transcript. And that transcript, so since Swan is a very visual person, he's into arts, into paintings. So what does his brain do? His brain makes a design, an architecture, a thought. And it is this all together, the cognitive part, the emotional part, that helps him memorize this tune. I have one and a half minutes, and I go, and I go maybe then, I have a little more, okay, that's good to be last. So I'm going through the next part that you will see. I want to want to, I left the sentences long to convey to you this beautiful language, but you can see wherever there are three points, I skipped whole parts because it would be too long. So what happens next? So now we move, actually it's a year later when this happens, when this happens again, that he goes, so he, he actually wanted to remember this, but then he forgot. So here we come, the long-term memory. Indeed, this passion for a phrase of music seemed for a time to open up before Swan the possibility of a sort of rejuvenation. This is still the second time, I'm sorry, but then it moves on. Swan found in himself, so this is what music does, in the memory of the phrase that he had heard, the presence of one of those invisible realities in which he had ceased to believe and to which, as though the music had, had opened the moral barrenness from which he was suffering, a sort of recreative influence, he was conscious once again of the desire and almost the strength to consecrate his life. Before we hear that Swan is into society, he has no more wishes, he has had it all, he has had lovers, he has money, he has, and he was disenchanted with everything. But this piece of music, it brings back, it makes him feel like the world still speaks to him. And this is what art does to him. But never having managed to find out whose work it was that he had heard played that evening, he had been unable to procure a copy and had finally forgotten the quest. And now the third time. But that night at Madame Verdurin's, scarcely had the young pianist begun to play. Swan sensed its approach, so of the little phrase, and recognized secret murmuring detached the airy and perfumed phrase that he had loved. And it was so peculiarly itself, it had so individual, so irreplaceable a charm that Swan felt as though he had met in a friend's drawing room a woman whom he had seen and had admired in the street and had despaired of ever seeing her again. Finally, the phrase receded, diligently guiding its successors through the ramification of its fragrance, leaving on Swan's features the reflection of its smile, so of the, the smile of the phrase. But now, at last, he could ask the name of his fair unknown and was told that it was the Andante of the Venteus Sonata for piano and violin. And this is just, so we have it, the, the emotion, the recognition of that, the re-experiencing everything. And I really want, for the sake of time, not to read the fourth passage, but in the fourth passage, we learn actually something else very important. On that evening, he sits next to Odette. Odette is a fine courtesan, and it is this little andante, this little phrase, becomes the hymn of their love. So Swan, in this context, loving this woman, he also feels that the people around are charming. He feels that this woman, who actually does not fit to him at all, is charming and falls in love with her. And so we see all the different parts that we have heard of. We see the reward of recognizing something. We see the strong emotion, what it did to him, this rejuvenation process. And 
we experience, for lack of time, I cannot show this to you, but Marcel himself, the writer, experiences many volumes later something very similar. He also hears this peculiar andante. And now what is very interesting is the juxtaposition of these two protagonists. One hears just the sonata, and they both have synesthetic pleasures. And that is, by the way, a very important theme, the synesthesia. You know, we see in Swan, he has other associations. And in that second part, uh, Proust calls the sonata white and associates it with a particular, and the, the, the septet, because the, the composer developed this music in an ample piece of music towards the end of his life. And we find an appeal to creativity ourselves. So the writer is also just frequenting saloons, high society, and has no real great interest in life anymore. And listening to the septet of Ventoy, Marcel Proust comes to the decision that creativity and generating something as immortal as art is the only value you can obtain in life. And that's where actually the recherche then begins. So, and he, he, he brings up figures of angels of Bellini and of Mantegna, and he has all these different associations, so images that are very, very, very clear, and that one type of music is white, the other type of music is red, because it's not two instruments anymore, but it is seven instruments. And in both protagonists, it evokes keen interests in ideal values and in finding a path to one's own uniqueness, to one's own immortality, as we have heard from Rita Leva, Rita Leva Montalcini, immortal means what do we leave behind and not this, this body. So I have hoped, actually, I was so glad to hear the other speakers alluding on many of these fragments, the reward system, the, the uh, memory system per se, but here we have it, have it all, and we even have your particular interest, dance, because Proust writes in a different passage about our body memory. So the protagonist walks in rainy, Paris, and he slips on a cobblestone. And that brings up an image, a body movement. He basically loses his equilibrium. And that brings him back to the Piazza San Marco in Venice, because there he slipped, and his body made the same movement. So also there, you have a body memory for things. And that is illustrated. So Proust, 100 years ago, not knowing any of these mechanisms, has just laid them down for us in this most marvelous, and this beautiful, in this very, very moving uh, language. And with that, I close my talk. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Beautiful talk. Thank you very much indeed. Really, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. So I guess I went over time. So no, no. I think we are. We have done uh, well. Everyone saw you had. Uh, uh, I think questions. Pietro. Thank you, Anna. Congratulations. Excellent. Wonderful talk. Um, I have a general question, that, uh, just a, a comment. We have been uh, heard, hearing uh, the, the entire um, uh, Saturday, the moment, the mechanism of uh, memories and the formation of memories and so forth. But uh, what about forgiving? The mechanism of forgiving, if, if, you, think, if you consider a cell, it's, all, it's always uh, uh, um, synthesizing something, but it has to destroy something. And I think it's uh, extremely important. So are you asking about forgetting? Exactly. About, about the other goddess yes. later. So that is a very important question. But this, well, I, I had a few slides. So in animal models, forgetting is not studied so well. But uh, there are a few other um, uh, uh, models that are very well. So forgetting there are two big essential theories. And they both go back to some important German scientists 100 years ago. So one, if you Google when you go home, and given Ebbinghaus, you will see the forgetting curve. So Ebbinghaus, um, in, at the end of the 19th century, generated this forgetting curve, showing very clearly that 
in about five weeks if you've learned something by heart and you don't come back to that and if it is not unique, if it does not have images, 80% is forgotten. And in fact, forgetting, we are not talking about the pathological forgetting, but the physiological forgetting is something very, very important. You don't need to know where you've parked your car yesterday. That's not important. So it is very, very important. Also traumatic events, it's important to forget certain things and it is over, overridden. The other, so this theory is the decay theory, and I'm sure that, that, that there is a part to that. But then there is something else, and that is very important for our modern world, um, and that is the interference theory. And that was actually also by two Germans, 1900, proposed that if we experience something, lots of experimental work, so psychology in humans, saying that once you experience something, this very moment, if something else happens shortly after that, and we're talking the first five and 10 minutes, it interferes with what we have heard from Christina with the consolidation of the memory that you've built before. And so this interference theory also produces forgetting. But also that, now that is very important because in our modern world, we incessantly do things at the same time and run from one appointment to the next. So I'm very much interested in that. Um, in, the, in the mouse, in, in the most models, it's not experience, but it is in the Rosofi land fly and in C. elegant in the worm, the mechanism, the molecular mechanism, these animals also, animals, these creatures, they also forget. So forgetting is absolutely essential um, and it's a counterpart in, uh, in the C. elegant and in Drosophila, in the Drosophila is the dopamine system that plays a role. So there, it is, um, okay. it's not the and same pathway. The it's pathway. not as okay. if you have one um, molecular pathway and it goes backwards. It's different pathways, one leading to learning and the other one leading to forgetting. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. I'd like to... I would like to close the session uh, with one remark, and then uh, uh, Viviana has, uh, I would like also to call her to make one remark. Just one, I want to thank all the speakers for a remarkable session, a remarkable event. Really, thank you very much indeed. All the attendees, thank you very much. And one remark, you know about the discussion uh, about uh, the two cultures, uh, scientific culture and humanistic culture, snow and all that debate. You know also about the importance of scientific culture in our present day society. I think that uh, really uh, uh, th this morning has been an example that uh, there is only one culture and I like to say the culture of studying the mind and the brain is probably unifying everything. And uh, with this I think I thank you very much and uh, Viviana I would like to call you on stage and thank you. And you complete. to in a very low way, we went to the peaks of intelligence and brightness. I want to remind you that we do these events with Brain Circle Italian, Italy and together with Ebri and together with the University of Jerusalem and together with many other important centers. This we all done, we all do, uh, as you see, our, all our events are for free. We open them to everybody. We need your support. So I'm talking to you and I'm talking to the people who listen to us at home. We have a website called emotionsbrainforum.org. You can donate if you like, even very little for our work. And we also have these beautiful t-shirts uh, that were designed by our web director, Sandro Ghini. There is a different one from each city. If you want to buy them on our website, uh, this will be a great support for us, and thank you. And the next appointment is in Lugano, December 3rd, and we'll talk about emotion and gender uh, differences, whether men and women have different emotions. So the appointment is on December 3rd. Thank you to everybody. Oh, see. <laughs>